Chili Effect is sponsored by WallStreetWindow.com and listeners like you. And now, and now the, most, the most underrated voice in all, in all media, Chuck O'Chelly. February 15, 2024, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar, this is the O'Chelly Effect, which coincidentally went live for the first time on a uh, broadcast platform of any sort exactly 10 years ago on February 15th, 2014. <laughs> okay, so here we go. That's when it went live. There were podcasts before that in the uh, previous year and all that good stuff. But, hey, if you're signed up at Ocelli.com and you're receiving the archive emails as we go, then uh, you already know this because you got the earliest Ocelli effects that were recorded and never aired live anywhere in that set. But look, I'm not here to talk about that. Not at all. We're here to continue on with not just the tradition of the Ocelli effect, but how about this? In 2014, I met this guy named Carmine Savastano. How did we meet each other? Effectively, I believe it had something to do with uh, these groups on Facebook. I, I know Facebook, but anyway. Yeah, 2014 is calling you and asking you about useless things. Uh, anyway, uh, 2014, it was Facebook, all right? And uh, there, there was these groups on Facebook like JFK, Hucksters, Mythmakers. Uh, actually, there wasn't Mythmakers. It was like Hucksters, Sham Artists. I forget. But basically, a whole bunch of stuff where it was like people that are fake and BS in the JFK assassination realm of alleged research, of information streams. And there were people on Facebook in groups complaining about it, in addition to the JFK Venter group, <laughs> which, um, you know, was was run by a guy who was really actually pretty curious. But look, I don't want to talk about Facebook groups. Either way, this suggestion was made that I should talk to this guy, Carmine Savastano, and he had been working on a book and I wasn't sure if the book was published at that point or anything. Anyhow, I decided to talk to Carmine because his book was about three assassinations, TPAK, T-P-A-A-K.com. You go there. That stands for Two Princes and a King, which happens to be the title of that book. And it was a concise review of three assassinations from the 1960s, the two princes being the Kennedy brothers, JFK, RFK, and King being Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., all of them assassinated in the 1960s, as you well know. So I'm rehashing stuff. Why? Carmine wanted to talk about his book, of course, and we did, and we formed a friendship at that point in time. And one of the bases for that friendship was him and I both complaining about people spreading ridiculous nonsense and alleging that it was information that was valuable in the case. Yep, our complaint over what this was, and I told him then, I really want to do shows about the myths, and we didn't use the word myths at first. Actually, we had to debate a bit about what to call it. But it was like fake crap in the JFK community is what we were thinking of. <laughs> little little more blunt, less refined of a title. But either way, I said, Carmine, you got to do this with me. And he has. 16 episodes all together over the years. The last one was actually some years ago in 2020. But we started in 2015 with episode one, episode three, markedly. One of the episodes we dedicated to Judith Mary Baker. But... It's not all about Judy. It's all about getting at all of the misinformation, disinformation, nonsense, poorly reviewed, uh, researched nonsense that's out there regarding the JFK case. And JFK Myths was born, one of the most valuable uh, series that we've done here on the Ocelli Effect. And how do I know that? Because I keep getting told it. Didn't know it would be as big or as many episodes as it was. I thought we might do five, ten and be done. But uh <laughs> People have been asking. So here we go again in the year 2024, going further with the JFK Myths series. And with me tonight is Mike Swanson, the guy behind WallStreetWindow.com. Be in the know. Go to Wall Street Window. I don't just tell you that I recommend his writings, his books, because he's a sponsor here. Nope, I recommended them before he was a sponsor, but he is a sponsor of the Ocelli.com network. Thing is, I recommend his writing highly because he takes very complex things in books like The War State and Why the Vietnam War, which is the first in a series of planned volumes on that conflict. Why the Vietnam War or The War State, both of them authored by Mike Swanson. 
And you'll find that Mike actually uh, authored a whole bunch of other books and partially authored other things on Amazon, some of them about finance, one book about the history of Danville, Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll be frank with you. I'm not a money guy. I didn't read his money books. I did read some other stuff and he even has one out there, which uh, his dad wrote that he wrote a forward to. I think it's still available in uh, ebook form about the Roman Empire. But anyway, Mike, definitely a student of history and a student of the JFK case. Glad to have him along for JFK Myths 17. But also the war state and you know, that's that red book, by the way, you see in the sidebar at Ocelli.com with Ike giving his farewell address about the military industrial complex, etc., and uh, in case you didn't know, and if you listen to my show, you know, and also welcome to planet Earth. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're listening to this. If you didn't accidentally find it, you know, Mike Swanson is Mike. How you doing tonight? That we don't know. I'm doing great. It's great to, <laughs> to talk to you and Carmine and our other special guests. Mm, right. Who I'm going to get to third in the order. Uh we have Carmine Sabastano, who I just gave a, another intro to, but he is the author of Two Princes and a King, as I said previously, and also Human Time Bomb, <laughs> right? Um, yep. the, the, the book that will be a controversy, as they say, on the other side of the island, when we discuss it on the other <laughs> side of the uh, pond, excuse me, not island, on that island on the other side of the pond over there in England. Um, but, uh, yeah, Human Time Bomb. Right. There's that about the human condition and violence in it and all that. We'll get there eventually. But Two Princes and a King happily sits on my bookshelf. Uh, and and uh, I did request that Carmine sign it for me. I don't request too many signed books, but, you know, my friends, I'd like to have a signed book from. It's personalized. Never going to trade it away or give it away, although sometimes they are stolen. Um, and actually, they get <laughs> stolen at conferences. And I'm yeah. going to make a few other inside jokes, but Carmine, good to have you back on the show. Glad to continue the myths with you. How you doing tonight? T-Pak, T-P-A-A-K dot com, your website. How are you, sir? I'm okay. It's good to be back. Um, definitely, yeah, it's, as we were just discussing before off air a little bit, it's almost been a decade. <laughs> almost a decade. 17 episodes of this. <laughs> they just, The hits just keep coming. <laughs> Well, what's funny is, I mean, and we've actually created other historical podcasts, you know, where we examined other assassinations and things built off of the myths episodes because we had to go into like Benzir Budo and a few other assassinations, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, what, what did we do? We did a whole thing on South America. I mean, went through. Yeah, uh, Budo, Trujillo. Uh, we discussed uh, Patrice Lumumba in the Lumumba, Congo. Right. You know, that. Uh, the, the lovely CIA hands off handing him to Mobutu. They didn't kill him directly, <laughs> right? And which has always been what they said. So it, that that is true. They didn't kill him directly. No, <laughs> but their station chief in Leopoldville did happen to pass on to Mobutu that Lumumba was trying to kill him, which was never proven. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's so. that. There's that, and and that whole situation where everybody ends up at a billiard table or something like that. Uh, was that Trujillo where they all like? The, it's uh, maybe. Like, yeah, I think I think that was the one. Where, yeah. It's like this weird standoff. Imagine like a presidential palace in the, uh, you know, in the billiard room, if you will. And all of a sudden people realize there's a whole bunch of people planning on killing each other all in the same room. Magically happened. Uh, nobody, you know, positioned people or anything to have that happen. Yeah. Uh, uh, can, can, can you detect sarcasm? Anyway, uh, a lot of stuff we went into. Even, a matter of fact, the attempted assassination attempts um, and various twisted webs of stuff in North Korea we even went over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's part of Yeah, we, and uh, mm -hmm. there's also an episode, if uh, you can find out, they're called Putin on the Hits, where right. we actually went over the over a dozen people that Vladimir Putin either likely or verifiably had murdered <laughs> during right. the course of his tenure as a dictator. Right. No judgments or anything, just the history, if you will. Uh, you know, we do call it sinister history because it is kind of sinister to murder people, but it is part of history yeah. as well. So that subset not being covered tonight, we're on back on to the myths, but sometimes it causes us to jump off into other directions. And in the future, by popular demand, we're bringing back the myths, might have to bring in some sinister history as well. We'll see what kind of t time Carmine can allow us in the near future because, uh, you know, I can only book people so often, but because of the rotations, yeah. I have ideas. Maybe you could trade off with Larry or Mike on Thursdays or Wednesdays, and we can, uh, well, build upon our previous work as I re-release some of this stuff because it's not available on YouTube like it used to be. 
Mm-hmm. Anyway, our special guest. Why is he special? Because he's not usually here for these things or the show. Matter of fact, I don't think he's been on the show before. And uh, we will refer to him as, uh, uh, in some circles, Scooter. Why? Well, that might be because I like my other two guests tonight, co-hosts tonight, and also Joe now is a co-host because that's what you are on the Myth Show. Uh, guess what? He was at the Lancer Conference this year. <laughs> and and there might be a story behind the scooter thing we're not going to tell tonight. But uh, if you're aware, there might be a reason why we call Joe Borelli Joe Scooter Borelli. Anyway, he does a lot more than that. He works with Rob Clark, the lone gunman, all that kind of stuff. Joe, how would you introduce yourself to the audience that maybe has heard about you on this show a little, <laughs> but hasn't heard you on the show? How would you introduce yourself, Joe? Well, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, how would I introduce myself? I am an avid student of history, and I started working and reading about World War II, and as my grandfather was Norm- Normandy plus 10, he was actually going to be one of the first waves, but my great-grandmother died, and he left to go home uh, for a few days, which pushed him back a few days, and it's probably why I'm here talking to you. And I started making my way up through history and uh, got to the JFK assassination and was like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. Listened, read for years, and started doing my own primary research. Ah, your own primary research, which uh, eventually led you to starting to work with Rob Clark. I think you were just kind of a fan of the Lone Gunman podcast. Uh, maybe you had heard of mine at some point. Uh, previous to this year at Lancer, but you and I met at Lancer, and um, <laughs> you did you did a solid presentation there uh, with Rob, uh, a recorded one, and then you were taking questions afterwards uh, about the uh, the many Martins, if you will, in the JFK case, mm-hmm. which is you know a fascinating tidbit, not necessarily going to solve the case for us, but amazing how many people there are named Martin that are tied to the case in one way or another, whether filming it, possibly participating in it, and everything else. Uh, you guys did a, an entertaining video presentation there. And, uh, you know, go ahead and promote what it is you want to promote here in case I forget later. Great. Well, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. And, uh, yes, it was about the anomaly of all these people named Martin showing up uh, from the early 60s to Watergate. Um, and we actually started out as a joke. Uh, hey, we found another Martin. And it actually evolved into a very specific deep dive on a couple of interesting Martins. Maybe maybe we'll get into a couple of them today. One has to do with um, one of the myths of uh, a Martin that took a very interesting video. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, we found uh, a lot of tidbits and really interesting things. I had an hour conversation with uh, Mr. Larry Hancock on Sunday morning of the conference. It was probably my highlight Mm -hmm. about some of the documents I found. I believe Carmine is uh, uh, familiar with some of the ones I'm talking about with uh, James Herbert Martin and, and Wanda Martin. And, um, you know, we went further on John T. Martin, which we'll get into later. And it it really evolved into a more focused investigation on a couple Martins. And that's what really turned heads, not really the the coincidence of the name. So that's Mm -hmm. how I would kind of sum it up. Right. No, hey, fair enough. And uh, always good to have any kind of conversation with Larry Hancock, uh, regular co-host here at Ocelli.com, The Ocelli Effect. And now he's on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday. We hear from uh, what some people call him Professor Hancock. But uh, Larry Hancock, the great author of many, many books, and I'm not going to sit here and list them because we only got so much time tonight. But uh, you guys can definitely find him in the archive at Ocelli.com. And uh, as per usual, we'll give you a link to The Lone Gunman since we mentioned them. And, uh, you know, they're going to also get mentioned a little later. Uh, And the fact that uh, Joe was at Lancer is going to play a part in some of what we're going to discuss tonight. But uh, hang around and you'll find out about it. So with no further ado and no more of me running my mouth, Carmine, 
where should we begin? Uh, myths 17, for God's sake. Uh, where, where are we beginning here? Well, just uh, uh, for those who didn't hear in the last episode, our, what we'll be discussing for a portion of the show, what I primarily have been uh, doing research into and to some of the figures that are claimed in it is a series called Who Killed JFK by Rob Reiner. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, well, first off, uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to get this out of the way right away. Uh, Meathead does not necessarily understand the uh, assassination, okay? <laughs> I'm just – that's my words. Nobody else said it. Blame me. And I'm not just picking on him for a role he played. I mean, look. Uh, you can take a look at South Park's uh, wonderful uh, parody of him. Maybe I'll uh, steal a clip here or there and stick it in during the show just for fun. But, um, yeah, kind of a messy thing and unfortunately got a lot of play and was a a, a, a huge part of the WEC conference, believe it or not, this year, uh, is this Reiner presentation. And that drives me crazy um, because a lot of it just, Oh, man. Well, Carmine, uh, go ahead. I mean, what what can I say? I'll turn it over to you, man. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, Reiner begins this series during the period when Jack Ruby would fatally attack Lee Harvey Oswald. He recounts his feelings and ideas uh, when he observed the event on television during his youth, and then he discusses Oswald's statement of being a patsy. And while certainly Jack Ruby had mob connections, um, one official's denied, and We've prior offered the FBI informant documents on this show, and I do believe in the Lone Gunman as well, <laughs> mm -hmm. that show he was an FBI informant. Right. And his first visitor in jail following Oswald's death was one of the Campisi brothers, local Dallas mobsters that were familiar with Ruby. But without the specifics in the show, anything about Ruby's criminal past, it just veers from there into broadcasts from the day of the assassination and Reiner's personal experience following the assassination – uh, the narrator, Soledad O'Brien, states that Rob Reiner is a great storyteller, and I heartily agree. Yeah, it, look, maybe, maybe, look, I, let's let's reserve judgment and be objective. Perhaps he is a good storyteller. Uh, oh, no, perhaps. I think he's a good storyteller. You know, but... <laughs> I agree. Uh, on the other hand... Bastards are going down now! What? I'm not Rita Poon. I'm Rob Reiner, and you've just been Reiner. Come on, boys, let's make our escape! There you go. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Reiner states he discussed the Kennedy assassination with political satirist Mort Saul, who is skeptical of the government's findings. Mm. Reiner notes that he read Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, and that in his mind it took apart the Warren Commission. However, Mark Lane's book and later film contain some inaccuracies and outright myths, which have already been reviewed on the Achelli effect, and I've touched upon different versions of that, I do believe, on uh, the Lone Gunman podcast as well. Uh, the Lone Gunman, look, it's been covered on quick hits, and and to be generous uh, about this, and, and I think we should be when it comes to Mark Lane, because Mark Lane, quite honestly, uh, did a lot, of, a lot more good for the case than bad, in my opinion. He, on balance, he's definitely a positive figure. I, I think he's a positive figure in that he publicized the case more. Right. So that more of the public had access. Well, not only Unfortunately, that, yeah. what he used to publicize the case is highly questionable sometimes. Well, sometimes. But on the other hand, you're talking about the 1960s. You're not talking about the HSC. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. He didn't have access. I'm not, yeah. I, I'm not saying that it's his fault because he should have had more evidence. I'm saying that he just – like when he – in, pretended to be – I mentioned – I think I might mention this later when I'm going over uh, him being used – one of his claims being used as a reference. He did impersonate officials to get witness testimony. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I mean, true. He, he did do some dishonest things. <laughs> true. And, you know, some so. of the some of the representations that he uh, made regarding, say, you know, trying to represent Oswald and yeah. things like that in his interests, not necessarily – but, you know, to me, a couple of factors here. First of all, the amount of information somebody's working with in 1964 five, which is when he starts making statements and he's making presentations into the seventies again, before HSCA, before Oliver Stone's movie, before the ARRB, before a lot of us had a lot of access to a lot of things, uh, coupled with the fact that he was also what primarily a lawyer, um, and a politician means that I think it's inevitable that, 
you know, there's going to be some sketchy stuff happening, and that's a guarantee with Lane. So I, I kind of yeah, have to I, take I, it. I don't, I don't think that takes away from what he did prove that right. was deficient about the commission. I just think that it has to be put on balance. Yeah, sure, sure. But with, I mean, you know, the things that he did that are set back. You but know, it, and made people look bad. But again, he's and not, made witnesses not want to talk to other people. I mean, how many other interviewers were then denied well, well, by right. those witnesses? Right. Well, but see, that goes back to witness contamination, which, yeah. believe it or not, even the even if you can directly point to Lane doing damage there, I can point to a lot of other people doing a lot worse damage than Lane. Oh did. yeah. Yeah. Regarding that. I'm just I saying mean, his book isn't some sort of – the way that Reiner frames it is a way that I've heard it framed before. It's not some sort of Bible. No one JFK book has all the answers. In fact, right. all of them put together don't have all the answers. Yeah, well, that's the so, same part. Yeah. Well, it, but there you go. And yeah. we run into this a lot with people with David Lipton's book as well, Best Evidence, yeah. where Best Evidence, that's it. That's the end-all, be-all. And it's like, eh, look, first of all, 1980 when that was published the first time. I think. And, you know, David Lipton is part of the first generation of researchers, indeed, even though he didn't publish till way later and the video. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm actually going to give uh, the Reiner some credit. I believe Lane mentioned it, too. That's probably where he got the cats, what I'm about to say next. Uh, but I will give some credit. That they had at least a couple of good ideas in the thing. So I try to at least give, you know, be even handed with it when they get something right. I try to mention it. But. <laughs> for the Fair most enough. part. Fair enough. So let's tear into this and, and go to uh, the, the facts, please, uh, Carmine. Okay, <laughs> so um, uh, the series mentions the Katzenbach Memo, a document written by Nicholas Katzenbach, who served as the Kennedy administration's deputy attorney general and later the Johnson administration's attorney general. In the memo, the Katzenbach clearly states that the public must be convinced that Oswald is the lone gunman. And while it is not a smoking gun for an assassination conspiracy – it does prove the early formation of an official cover-up. Unlike most of the material Reiner has offered thus far, only this memo, a verifiable document, has, in my view, any actual value. Mm. The concealment and destruction of evidence is certainly underway at this point, and the timelining grows over time, as we have learned in more recent days. The Katzenbach memo further offers the President's Commission was tasked by its creators with delivering Oswald to the public as the lone guilty party. Further, Alan Dulles being placed upon the commission was indeed a means for some of the agencies, such as James Angleton, to influence and eventually take the investigation from those first personnel ordered to investigate. Now, that, you know, withstanding, that is basically the only thing in the early episodes that I think has any value. So then he shifts gears and begins to discuss the military industrial complex and the divisive nature of military leadership that opposed Kennedy's policies. Some claim that military leaders are responsible for the assassination or their determination to enter a war with Cuba serves as reasoning for such ideas. However, a military leader, in my view, had much to lose in conspiring against JFK. And further, it was during this period of the Cold War in which military had nearly ceaseless setbacks due to poor planning and the lack of significant forethought. While it's possible, because anything is possible – Military leaders conspired. It was some of the same leadership and their protégés that delivered us enormous military failures in Korea, Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Certainly a war or military action is more complicated to plan than an assassination of a single leader, but some clarity about those purported to have conspired is useful and some verifiable evidence would be as well. Reiner offers neither. Mm -hmm. Reiner then met with author Dick Russell mm -hmm. and sources his book, The Man Who Knew Too Much – which supports the claims of Richard Case Nagel. Nagel is, often, is an often mentioned figure that claimed he entered a bank and fired into the air prior to the Kennedy assassination because of his supposed foreknowledge. Nagel states that years following the actual events that he wanted to be in custody so that conspirators would be unable to force him to participate. Um, further claims, he states, are uh, that he possessed identification matching Lee Harvey Oswald's alias – but there is far more to Nagel's story. Nagel was indeed a member of Army Intelligence during the 1950s. But years prior to his claims, he was the only survivor of a plane crash from which he bore serious mental and physical scars. This left him, according to his superiors and colleagues, less stable. Eventually, Nagel's family would abandon him after his increasing erratic behavior and following a period of unemployment. Nagel soon became homeless and began living in his car. Likely from desperation, he attempted to plan a crime with other unnamed individuals, one of which shot him in the chest. Mm -hmm. These are the events prior 
of prior months and weeks preceding the bank episode that so many have placed faith in and certainly would allow one to question the veracity of his claims. I was sent the El Paso police reports from the incident by researcher Steve Rowe and was able to verify that instead of the dramatic episode Miguel would report, the event was a failed robbery. Mm. The evidence offers that Nigel entered the bank demanding money, shot into the teller window and not into the ceiling, then attempted to flee the scene. He was later apprehended by police trying to escape in his car. Items found in Nigel's vehicle, some claim link him to Oswald and the Central Intelligence Agency, but these ideas, too, are not supported by evidence. The documents upon closer review do not match the alias of Oswald, and the CIA names in this possession were likely former contacts or related to past military intelligence operations and don't prove a more recent connection with the agency. Okay. Might, I'd like mm-hmm. you to pause right there to give sure. the other panelists a chance to uh, address Richard Case Nagel and the claims, and let me play devil's advocate for 10 seconds here. And sure. say that, uh, look, you know, just because it's not in the police report doesn't mean it didn't happen. You know, cops leaving things out of police reports or misrepresenting things in police reports is something that I do commonly see. And well, depending on, oh, well, just hang on. And depending on circumstances, mm-hmm. I mean, you could have uh, completely benign explanations for missing Mentions of evidence, missing collections of evidence, uh, representations from the police, etc. Don't worry, Carmine, you're going to get back around to it. But I want to give Mike and Joe both a chance to comment on Richard Case Nigel, the claims in general, and uh, what it is we know about him and his circumstance, because he's also tied to the Garrison investigation um, and a few other things that people have talked about over the years. So. Uh, Mike, you have any anything to offer regarding Richard Case Nigel? What you think of the claims, the representations by, uh, you know, either Dick Russell or the people who have kind of, you know, grabbed onto him as somebody? I mean, he's even mentioned quite prominently in one of the books I highly recommend, which is, uh, you know, JFK and the Unspeakable. And uh, well, you know, right there, uh, there, there, there's quite a bit of mention by Doctor Douglas. Uh, regarding the veracity of his claims and things like that. Uh, again, you know, Dr. Douglas, nobody's perfect, but, uh, you know, what can I say? I, I have mixed feelings about Case Nagel and the reliability of the story, the claims, etc. cetera. Uh, what do you think, Mike? Do you have any views on this? Mike, did I put you to sleep, Mike? <laughs> Maybe he's talking to his mute button. Okay. Well, yeah, I just had the mute button on. No, no, um, go ahead. Yeah, so he figures prominently. He's the basis of a book written by Dick Russell called "The Man Who Knew Too Much," right? Which was it must have come out in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And um, uh, this book has been one of the main sources of the Rob Reiner uh, podcast series, and he's. And Russell himself is a main consultant on the series, and a lot of his ideas uh, appear to have been either uh, injected into the series or the basis of the series, uh, which we may get into later. Um, for it, well, I'll, that, I'll talk about that uh, after we talk about Nagel, because he names someone that could be a mastermind of the assassination in his book. Which is also, and he fingers this, and, and Reiner fingers him in, in, in the podcast. But as far as Nagel goes, um, you know, the, the book, uh, I, I, when I went through my first phase of being interested in the Kennedy assassination, it was right before, it was a year or two or three before the Oliver Stone movie came out and all these, and there's a wave of, Kennedy assassination books that were big sellers right. and this lasted I don't know five six seven years and the Russell book was one of the last books in this wave that had a giant splash and also ended up being one of the last books I read during that phase of back then of, of my first interest in this um, and he it's it's he's a great writer it's it's very well written uh, and it's a good it 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 it's it's a he makes uh, Nagel a, a good story, an interesting uh, character because he talks about how he you know has gotten in 
information from him, but he's Nagel's holding back. Um, but the big story with Nagel uh, that get gets your interest is that uh, before the assassination, mm-hmm. uh, he goes into a bank and um, takes a gun out. Yeah, Carmine just covered all that, uh, you know, basically. And uh, I just want to add here that uh, the first publication of The Man Who Knew Too Much was in 1993. And then a very, very much changed and updated version was released 10 years later in 2003. Uh, I'm not sure how many times it's been reprinted, uh, so on and so forth. But, yeah, indeed, uh, Russell's an excellent writer in general, objectively. Uh, But but what Carmine did is kind of debunk that story mm-hmm. uh, of him, you know, the story of this guy goes in a bank and he shoots himself, shoots the gun because he wants to get arrested so he can avoid being implicated in the assassination or framed or is caught up in it. Uh, Carmine pretty well has debunked that yep. through the documents to make it look like it probably had to, or to prove that it probably had nothing to do with the assassination at all. You know, not, at least the story was was not – is well, different from not as presented, you know, because as presented in yeah, the book because of the uh, yeah. the whole contradiction there about, you know, this sort of like uh, it's just the innocent kind of move here to get himself arrested on purpose and not really try to do anything criminal. Uh, he didn't even attempt to flee the scene was the original, you know, the, the, the concept. But, but, that he had just yeah, but the answer, to answer your question uh, myself about what do I think of Nagel? Mm-hmm. I, you know, when I read the book, I mean, it was, he's very interesting. He's an interesting story. He's a great, you know, the book influenced me, honestly, uh, when I initially read it. Uh, it, it put me in one direction of thinking. I, I, don't, I don't really have as much anymore, but, uh, I don't really put much credence or importance anymore in the Nagel story myself. Fair enough. I don't, I don't really see it helping me, you know, figure out uh, who was behind the assassination or, or larger questions. It's just, um, to me, a minor story. And there's lots and lots of these stories that cropped up over the years. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, then don't, they don't seem to really, really go anywhere in the end. Well, and it goes a little deeper too, uh, because again, th- this was during my early years of interest as well, when this book was hot and it first dropped, uh, because I, I got in in about 88, as I've said, you know, around the 25th anniversary and didn't get serious until probably shortly after this. So I guarantee this book had influence on me because uh, it was one of those, you know, brand new have to go to the bookstore and go get it books uh, that I had heard about, you know, pre-internet and all that. So um, it was influential. And uh, one could say that it, it continues to be. And Russell, again, was another presenter at Lancer this year, uh, as well as I think he presented at WECT and other conferences. I think he was at three conferences this year alone. Um, and again, a, a solid writer uh, for entertainment value. Now, as historical precedent, another question. Joe, do you have any views on the man who knew too much? Yeah, I am kind of on the same page as you and Mike and Carmine. I have a lot of skepticism towards the story, especially uh, the comment of uh, the or the story of the cop asking him, you didn't really mean to, to rob that bank. And Nagel allegedly says, you're a pretty, pretty smart cop, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, that just doesn't sit well with me. Well, there's, <laughs> and, there's uh, that. I, mean, I, I have a, a lot of skepticism towards Nagel in the story, but I, mm-hmm. I agree. I think stories are going to play a main theme in this episode, and it is a really good story. It's an interesting story. It's semi-relevant, and uh, that's kind of my take on it. No, fair enough. And look, I mean, there's a lot more to it. The whole idea that he was supposedly following Oswald around at some point, people had claimed that he was uh, set up. He was going to have to kill Oswald uh, to either prevent or participate in the assassination. Whole lot of stuff there that's alleged. And again, he's also a guy that uh, I believe is, you know, the story is that he met with Garrison. Somebody threw a grenade at him. He presents Garrison with the grenade and says, yeah, not going to testify for you, pal. Um you know, I, I'm condensing stories here as quickly as I can because I don't want to stay on it too much. But good, yeah. Oh uh, well, I just wanted to 
answer your question from earlier before I moved on with the gal and sure. more information about him. But so the reason why is it's not just the police report. It's the police report and multiple witness statements that all corroborate each other and the gal. Mm-hmm. So either they did a conspiracy to frame him up and change everything that happened or it didn't happen the way Nigel said. Mm-hmm. What's more likely? No, understandable. But again, devil's advocate, right? Who collected the witness statements? Um, well, and that's fine. But how much – I'm just saying it becomes a conspiracy to try to stop Nigel. And he gives no reason, as I'm about to go into, to anybody why he did it at the time. It's only years later he starts to contrive these ideas. Yeah, I know. And then there's there's, no, the, there's nothing at the time that proves anything about what he says. There is no contemporary evidence or statement he ever made, not even in a court of law when he had the opportunity. Mm-hmm. No, right. And even the whole uh, you know uh, game that went on regarding footlockers and trying to find supposed yeah, evidence. Yeah, exactly. Had, yeah, where he was I lying know. to the police and sending them a wild goose. I mean, he's obviously not a credible source well, because he changes his story so much and invents so much. He's a messy source. And ultimately I conclude personally that uh, it, it is uh, probably likely uh, as a result of uh, head trauma, you know, really yeah. uh, that, yeah, that I, some of this goes on, but go ahead. Yeah. I, I was just going to say in the past, and I still do feel bad for Nigel mm-hmm. and Russell masterfully writes him as a dramatic character to feel bad for and to believe. Right. But ultimately, Nigel has no sources, has no real proof, and has had to alter his history to make it fit into the book. Fair enough. So, move, so moving forward, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I bring him up because he's actually one of the sources for the later assassins. Right. And because Russell just keeps throwing Nigel into this, like he mattered to the First of all, he's such a minor figure. He's been a re- okay. Anyway, so here I'll continue and finish him, and then you know. Okay, so yeah, like get back to the notes. Okay, so uh, um, I also might consider. Uh, I would add that Nigel attempted suicide multiple times following his arrest, mm-hmm. and sat in jail for months without giving any explanation for his actions. His arrest occurred September twentieth, nineteen sixty three, and preceded Oswald's employment at the Texas School Book Depository on October fifteenth by nearly a month. Mm-hmm. And there is no verifiable link between the two men that has been proven. Right. It was not until years later when Nigel presented his ideas that a JFK connection was seemingly created. Reiner states teaming with journalist Dick Russell, and they would travel to interview several multiple people connected to the case. They met with persons varying from Buell Frazier, noted for his testimony changes over time, to the wholly unreliable William Robert Tosh Plumley, who claimed to be a CIA asset that flew a team of men in to stop the Kennedy assassination. Yikes. Among – I'm sorry? Uh, as, as soon as you mentioned Tosh Plumley, I just have no choice yeah. but to kind of uh, make a, an exasperated expression because <laughs> it's just – Tosh Plumley is a source for many, many things that turn into JFK myths later, but go, go ahead. <sighs> among, uh, among those included in the myth are Watergate burglar and former CIA officer E. Howard Hunt and mafia hitman Johnny Roselli. Mm-hmm. Reiner follows these seriously flawed claims with the statement, quote, I want the truth. Yet seemingly every turn, no evidence is offered to prove what is claimed. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting to me, too, is that they're just thrown in. These are just three extra people in the conspiracy that are unrequired because none of them are named as an assassin of the mastermind. So these three guys plus Plumley. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> the numbers are just starting to increase to where it gets more and more unlikely what is being proposed. But anyway, so getting back to it. Um, utilizing documents, uh, and I, Chuck, have discussed this in the past for those who might have heard it. Uh, the show that we discussed this. I'm actually going to uh, try to work on some articles that will nail this down so there will be articles that people can link to to go to to read and go to the documents about some of these guys because they keep popping up even in the Reiner series as we'll see. So mm-hmm. utilizing documents in the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Plumlee's own statements, we can easily disprove the airplane journey or abort team story, the later named version of related earlier claims. Notably, Robert Plumley's story was not offered to investigators until the 1990s when film producer Bob Vernon presented it while set upon developing a related book or film. If we look when uh, at official documents from decades earlier, Plumley was arrested several times and confessed to officials, quote, that he has admitted to making up names of persons allegedly contacted by him. Mm-hmm. Additionally, the CIA internally reviewed its files after the Vernon claims and found no documents related to employing Plumley during the 1960s. Right. 
Plumley continues. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no! Right. Uh, later. Oh, later yeah. on, he's uh, later on. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Oh yeah. No. No. Yeah. And and that's what I think Plumley draws upon is that he later had connection with the CIA. Yeah. To then say that, well, of course, you know, I was secretly anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, Plumley continues to be jailed for various crimes in the period before the assassination, which would likely render him too notable for use by any thinking conspirator. A bureau interview of Plumley conducted in 1976 contains questions about his past associations with the aforementioned hitman Johnny Roselli, and Plumley responds to them. He, quote, did not see Roselli from 1963 to 1968. Mm -hmm. Thus, in his own words and without foreknowledge of his future claims, Robert Plumley disproves the very essence of his story and the rest of his claims dissolve lacking merit. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite Tosh Plumley claim is having witnessed the assassination from the other side of the street, by the way, uh, which is, you know. Um, yeah, trying to steal from Sherry Feaster. Yeah. Uh, wow. Really, really strange claim. Um, and uh, Vernon wound up collecting it. And, of course, our friend Wim Dankbar. Uh, our friend sarcastically, um, <laughs> you know, uh, later on gathers him into, I don't know, one, two, three uh, videos where he's, you know, d doing the whole here's Tosh Plumley uh, connecting. Let me see. Let me think about this for a second. Um, let's see. James Files, he's connected to that story. Uh, another myth. <laughs> <We've covered>. uh, <laughs> yeah. And and of course, then there's the other guy who claims to be one of the tramps. Right. <laughs> Oh, uh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Chauncey Phillips. Chauncey. Chauncey or, Holtz. Chauncey Holtz. Chauncey Holtz. Not yeah. Phillips. Yeah. Chauncey Holtz. Chauncey Holtz. Yeah. Right. So he's in the Chauncey <laughs> Holtz story. He's in the uh, James Files story. He's A in mixing. The, nice mixing of myths. Yeah. He just winds up cross-pollinating uh, throughout all that mess. He's in um, Judy's too, I believe, in some versions. I don't know. Maybe he's in Judy's story. Uh, well, it's hard to keep track with Judy, but, you know, Baker, yeah. of course. Anyhow, yeah, but please continue. <laughs> okay, so nevertheless, just for the information of the listener, I want to offer further evidence and information about Plumlee's supposed passengers, just so we can nail that down. It sure. just so happens I was able to locate both Everett Howard Hunt and Filippo Sacco, a.k.a. Johnny Roselli, on the day in question, and we discussed it here on the Ocelli Effect prior. Mm -hmm. Roselli, unknown to Tosh Plumlee and others who attempted to utilize him for their stories f following his death in varying myths, were unaware that the FBI had been trailing Roselli for months with informants and physical surveillance. This included the period in which President Kennedy was assassinated. The Bureau had multiple teams following Roselli's movements and used informants to monitor his possible future plans while also staking out his apartment in Los Angeles. Officials noted that November 18, 1963, Roselli was observed with Maurice Friedman and two female companions leaving a hotel in Arizona and took a flight to later register at the Desert Inn Motel, where Roselli was a member of its country club in Las Vegas. Simultaneously, the FBI observed Roselli's apartment during that period in Los Angeles and noted there were no signs of activity for days after President Kennedy's assassination. The only records of any plane ride taken by Roselli in that period were his relocation to different hotels, the last one in Las Vegas, not Dallas. When Roselli himself was called before congressional leaders regarding his location, November 22, 1963, he responded, quote, let me put it to you this way. The morning the president was assassinated, I was asleep in bed at the Desert Inn Hotel. Based upon FBI surveillance, informant tips, and even the gangster himself, Johnny Roselli was not in Dallas but Las Vegas when the events in Dealey Plaza transpired. Right. Kind of eliminating him as a shooter. So before yeah. we go to a break, which I'm going to do at about 10 after here, I want to get uh, both Mike and uh, Joe's view. I'll start with Joe this time if we don't uh, – if he doesn't mind. Uh, you know, anything you want to add here regarding Tosh Plumley or the uh, cross-pollination or that part of it, which is, again, featured in uh, Rob Reiner's set of JFK podcasts? Joe? Yes. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I really can't. Uh, shed any more context than Carmine just did on it. No, fair enough. But I mean, if you have the FBI having this guy under surveillance because he was an organized crime figure and was definitely a person of interest to the FBI at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I think Johnny Roselli was nowhere near uh, Dealey Plaza. Kind of hard to put a gun in his hand in Dealey Plaza. Just saying. I mean, hey, look, you could add in the, the other mafia stuff if you wanted to and 
Uh, people have misrepresented him as everything from the godfather of Los Angeles. Uh, I can't believe I just uttered that phrase. <laughs> but uh, they, they've tried to say that to um, – what was he? The Hollywood Don was another one, right? Uh, yeah. In, indeed. He was just the biggest the biggest mobster at certain times out there. That's all. Yeah. He wasn't – he was no, had no official ranking in the mob beyond being one of Giancana's men. Right. And here's the thing. There, there There's probably a hundred, um, let's call them Italian businessmen, that you can find uh, directly connected to Hollywood, more involved in Hollywood, exerting influence, uh, extortion, et cetera, in Hollywood um, during this entire time period. Let's go 1953 to 1973. And Johnny Roselli's one of them, but not even one of the most prominent ones uh, or the most active ones or the most profitable ones that we know of for certain. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's not hard to make a list of about 100 guys if you want. But anyway, Joe, I appreciate it. Uh, look, if you don't know, you don't know, and that's fine. But go ahead and check it out. I'm sure you'll find that uh, uh, Carmine's documentation is uh, is is very good on this and I think that if the FBI didn't know where he was on the 22nd, that would be one thing. But it uh, seems to me like he might be telling the truth when he said he was asleep in bed at the Desert Inn. Mike, do you have any views on uh, sure. Roselli or, uh, or or the cross-pollination of Tosh Plumley or any of this? The, the Plumley story, to me, it's just a useless story. I mean, it's just a useless story. Hmm. Uh, Roselli is a more important character you know he was a real really you know we know a lot of real things about johnny roselli that's right um and he really was hooked up with the mob he really was a go-between uh of the mob and the central intelligence agency he had dealings uh you know with um william harvey uh but that doesn't mean he was involved in the assassination of president kennedy Right, not JFK. The assassination attempts right. on Fidel Castro is yet another story, though. As yeah, to where, and, and, and he, yeah. he was plotting or contacted to get involved in that, but the, that plot, the mafia plot against Castro didn't go anywhere. Uh, <laughs> right. But all that said, you know, Roselli had a bad ending to his own life. He, oh, yeah. He ended up in a drum in the in the ocean. Right. Up. Soon before, at, well, actually, after he testified <laughs> right. to the church committee. Right. So, you know, well, I he, don't know why he ended up in that drum, but yeah. he did. Yeah, well, uh, look, there's a lot of ways you can end up in a drum when you're involved in certain businesses. And the thing is, you know, a lot of people make the claim that, well, before he could testify, he ended up in the drum. He actually testified to the church committee. We we have that. And yeah, he testified. I yeah. mean, did he test? Was he killed because of that? I don't know. He could have been killed because of some other reason, because a lot of mobsters get killed. Right. So, look. I uh, mean, they either get killed or they go to jail. It, listen, that's just the way it ends in a lot of cases. I mean, that's uh, what, you know, the the, the world. Um, anyway, look, Mike, speaking of useless information, I'm going to put Carmine on pause for a moment here because you have a previous engagement you're going to have to get to shortly. So sure. I, I want to uh, give you a chance to mention one of your uh, one, one of the myths that uh, drives you a bit crazy, <laughs> and I love this one because uh, I know we've mentioned it before, but I don't know if we broke it down really on this show. And uh, maybe we're not going to do an extreme breakdown here, but I want to give you a chance to mention this one because uh, you and I talked just before airtime, and uh, this is one of my favorites. Talk about you know. People want to talk about the uh, timing of death and what the cause was, what the uh, you know motivation for getting rid of Roselli was. Well, one of the more misleading, uh, hey, this is the reason why they got rid of JFK myths out there, is uh, is is one that you're going to mention here. Now there'll be links uh, not only to Carmine's notes but uh, to this story and others in the show notes. So check that out and also the chat at Ocelli.com. Mike, what what is the thing that uh, gets you when people say? This is why JFK was killed. Well, so to me, the craziest claim is that he was killed over UFOs. <laughs> and there's two um, uh, there's two pieces of evidence that people point to who make this argument. And I'm going to briefly touch on both of these two pieces of evidence. The first is a memo 
that Kennedy wrote on November the 12th, 1963, to the director of the Central Intelligence Agency demanding a classification review of all UFO intelligence files affecting national security. That's the subject of the memo. It mm-hmm. claims – or the memo states that um, – the Kennedy administration is making contacts with the Soviet Union for joint space and lunar exploration. exploration. Yeah. So we need to do a classification review of what we know about the UFOs in order to share the inf- information with the Soviets uh, and let them, you know, not mistake our cooperation with them as a cover for intelligence gathering uh, for defense and space programs and a book was a press release was put out on november the 22nd 2011 by a dr william lester Mm -hmm. about a book he was putting out called a celebration of freedom jfk and the new frontier uh so this book came out in 2011 and this book cites the memo that i just read the problem is the memo isn't real <laughs> and um that it's not in the national archives um and reporters uh, contacted the kennedy uh jfk library to ask them if they could find it they couldn't find it and since it can't be found in any historical places i'm saying it's not real i, I think it's a hoax uh, cause it can't be verified to be real. But this fellow that wrote the book, this Dr. William Lester, he also happened to be a director of the Mutual UFO Network, uh, which is one of these UFO, uh, groups. Um, so anyway, that, so that's the one piece of evidence. The other one is some collection of, hoax documents called majestic 12 which claim i sent i sent you a link to it so if people want to see it they can but it claims to be uh documents about ufos a secret group inside the government um created by harry truman to investigate the ufos and these are documents about the group and supposedly kennedy may have been killed over this too but Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think it's a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, I don't doubt that there are some, a very small number of these UFOs stories could be real, you know, in the sense that we, that they're not explained. But the vast majority of these things are hoaxes and the UFO community is just full of hoaxes and frauds among its leadership. Mm-hmm. Interesting that the claim, by the way, uh, from that author Lester was that uh, th- that this was released by a, a you know a sort of a secret whistleblower, an insider, right? A guy who worked for the CIA in the sixties and seventies who says he literally pulled it out of a burn bin so that it wouldn't disappear. Uh, not realizing. Yeah, that. I want to make one <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, one remark about that too. You get it, what's really getting me at this moment in time is the past six months we have seen these whistleblowers so-called whistleblowers <laughs> from the air force come out and make these claims that they know about ufos they know about alien bodies one of them testified to congress right these so-called whistleblowers i think they're frauds and the reason i think they're frauds is because what i've seen in my lifetime with whistleblowers that come out with top secret information is they get persecuted. Mm -hmm. Daniel Ellsberg was persecuted and he got, you know, went up to court. He won his court cases and, you know, didn't go to jail. But how many other whistleblowers have had, had gone to jail? You know, Julian Assange wasn't even American citizen (laughs) and, he wasn't, um, uh, you know, working for the U.S. government and releasing information, and they hounded him across the world. He went in an embassy. They got him out of the embassy. Now he's in jail. So how in the world do these 
whistleblowers, reported whistleblowers get away with saying all this stuff without getting in trouble. I think they're fakes. <laughs> well, the funny thing is that this this Majestic 12 thing and the there, there, there's not just the one memo, by the way. There's actually a set of documents that have circulated. And, uh, you know, prominently this stuff circulated in the late 90s, but it was out there before that. Uh, in the 80s, this was out there. And uh, if you go back to a, a, a little piece of disinformation out there called the Torbit document, there's a whole thing related to NASA and supposedly LBJ's involvement and the FBI being somehow involved in the assassination uh, directly. Um, and And all these things came together into this concept of the JFK was killed to prevent the uh, revelation of real aliens and the U.S. government's involvement with it. Now, a fascinating thing that happened recently is News Nation did some specials on George Norrie's, you know, TV show in Vegas, uh, former host, Coast Coast AM, um, interesting guy and all that. But uh, they had to have his JFK episode right after a couple of them on his UFO thing, and he ties it together oh. with the Majestic 12 stuff, right? Um Good grief. And people keep doing this, you know, over and over again. They keep bringing it back out no matter how many times you tell them top secret documents don't look this way. There's no, uh, you know, th this document, a, a memo like this exists in more than one form in more than one place. We can't find it in any of those spots. So somebody would have to pull it from all the copies that were available to the president, that were available uh, in the CIA, everywhere else. It would have to be completely scrubbed and put into a different format. There are others who have tried to defend this, saying that, well, they just reformatted it and have recreated it from a real document. And and it's like, where, where does the contortion stop regarding you don't actually have evidence for this? I just yeah. want to jump in, uh, if I could, real quick. Good, Carmine. Yeah. yeah. I just want to jump in and say, yeah, as you were saying, we actually did a show that's probably in Chuck's archives where we showed people how to tell a real document from a fake one. And it, it is, you know, as Mike said – the practice of some people to create fake documents. But what you need to do is you need to take, you know, it's like a test group and a control group. You go and get a document from the time period that this supposedly occurred in mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with this. And then look at the markings and begin to look at the language and then begin to look at the other traits of the document. And you'll soon find that you can begin to tell which ones are fake and which ones are real because all of that stuff suggested by Chuck is ridiculous that so many agencies would be interconnected in one – unless it's a paragraph about them, there's no way that certain agencies like three or four or five different agencies are all going to be signing off on the same thing. Right. And, and we, we go through each agency and as you know, you know, Mike <clears> – <throat> disbelieve the burn bag story as I do with a lot of things as well, even if they destroy it, as we know from the Defense Intelligence Agency, there's always another copy of something. There's always a marking left behind like Chuck's talked about uh, MK Ultra being figured out in the financial documents. There's always a trace mm -hmm. of something. Well, so and, it is yeah. almost impossible to purge something from the record. And if it doesn't exist anywhere in the record, chances are it's not a real record. Yeah. Well, and, and there's the problem, right, is, is that, again, we've also shown uh, on this show very, very succinctly that if you do what you said, look at the contemporaneous stuff and examine it and see that it doesn't match, number one. But even if they've gone out of their way to make something look relatively correct, um, again, the redundancy comes in. This is why and, – and we did a show on this why, like because people were asking, why is it that they redact one thing and then they don't redact it and this is a game they're playing? And it's like, no, this is – the inefficiency because of the bloated size of the bureaucracy that they can't possibly communicate with each other enough to get a consistent redaction. This is why you have some stuff that's redacted in one form and then you get it from another office. It's the same memo. It's redacted in a completely different way because somebody separately made that judgment and nobody bothered to collate these things because they can't. It's too massive to do. It's it, it, it even with the, all the wonderful computer technologies we have now, it's impossible for them to get all the copies of the documents that exist. Remember where all these copies went to. OK, even preserving the former systems and possibly track them all down to absolutely eliminate something. And we've seen this before where, yeah, the military intelligence doesn't have it, but the CIA does. The NSA doesn't have it, but 
<laughs> the ONI does, you know, or, or so on and so forth, because they can't even agree amongst themselves what should be removed, what should be redacted. They can't. <laughs> they just can't. It's impossible to make these determinations, even when they're trying to hide stuff. They've turned around and re-redacted things later that you might have gotten a copy of a document in 1988 that looks better than it does now in 2024 because they decided to redact more stuff later. And you could possibly have stuff that would be classified today, like can't see any of this. And yet, you know, that blacked out page didn't look like that in 88 because nobody thought to redact it in 88 yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, this happens back and forth all the time. Matter of fact, we even covered the fact that uh, they reclassified a bunch of documents and then you can't even find out which documents got reclassified. If you call up the National Archives and you say, look, I'm a good citizen. I want to turn back over these classified pieces of information that I have, which uh, I'm now not legally allowed to possess. I'd like to give them back to you. Um, you can't because they can't tell you even what it is that has been reclassified. You could potentially have stuff that's been reclassified if you collected it years ago because they change determinations as they go. Different attitudes come in, different ideas about what needs to be hidden and what doesn't, and it continuously changes. It's not an evolution. It's just a continuous sort of uh, uh, shifting of possibilities regarding this stuff. Um, do you think that's an accurate description, Carmine, or, or am I over-explaining this? Oh, yes. And and I think we uh, – last time we were uh, discussing the case, I – another, you know, just problem with the system is is there is, of course, overclassification that we all deal with, as you were stating. Right. But there's also, in some cases, underclassification because in the, in the latest batch of the 2023 documents, and I think some of the 2022s, maybe all the way back to the 2017s, there's files that shouldn't be in there. Yeah. There's later intelligence reports. <laughs> That just have the word JFK on them and some idiot <laughs> at either the Central Intelligence Agency or NARA was like, well, says JFK. <laughs> in, 20, Throw it in. in 2023, literally, there was there was stuff put out in the initial release that wasn't even requested. No, the um, JFK airport was one of the things I noticed yeah. when I was going through the files. Right. Stuff on the JFK airport. Uh, and, and a whole bunch of, I'm telling you, there, there's hundreds of files that were not even part of the request that were added. Well, yeah. And nobody has an explanation of how they got there, by the way. <laughs> They're just there. Well, I, I just, it's mismanagement. Yeah. It's mismanagement over time. And no one, as you said, collating or, you know, constructing some sort of viable system to keep everything in order. Yeah. Yeah. And and literally they can't get each agency to sit down and go, OK, uh, uh, like one because it's so massive. You know, you're talking about five million documents got dumped into the National Archives at one point. Right. All at once. Mm -hmm. And some of that stuff is duplications. Like I, I, I tell the story all the time about the multiple copies of a newspaper article I end up with when I when I was getting documents sent to me. And it was frustrating because I was paying for it by the page. Thanks. But um a newspaper article that somebody stuck in their file just happens to be there and was formerly classified. Now it isn't. I want the copy of it. I end up with three copies of a newspaper clipping because three different people on the same committee had it in their folders. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you get. And, yeah, they're under different numbers uh, and everything. It's all I'm saying <laughs> Is that, I think in that yeah. one case, in, in most of the cases, it's a hindrance, but in that one case, it can be useful if it's not prior published. Because sometimes what they'll do, like you said, it's not the same people doing everything. They'll – like one-third of each will be classified, but if you put the three together, you can get the whole article. <laughs> right. That's the funny part about so. it. Yeah. <laughs> Is that sometimes it's like paragraph one. Imagine there's three paragraphs in a document, okay, just a simple one-page document. There's three paragraphs. Well, in the first generation of that document, the first paragraph is completely blacked out, but the other two are not. In the second one, uh, two out of the three are blacked out, and only the second one is revealed. In the third one, the last two paragraphs are revealed, but the first one is still blacked out. Yeah, you can assemble the whole document <laughs> from the three sources. <laughs> yep. And that has happened, too. Um, 
True. Uh, but but yeah. that's rare. That's much rarer than finding just useless duplicates. Yeah, useless. <laughs> lots, of, lots of useless duplicates. Useless duplicates or singular words that are blacked. Like they blacked out words that were uh, not legible in the copies uh, for no reason, just because there was a chance that this meant something. It was a name, and the name is not legible. It's just not even you know even in the the pristine copy of it, it's not legible anymore because it's been copied and copied and. This is, you know, the committee guy's copy that he got from the copy of the congressman who, you know, and so on. Uh, anyway, Joe, any comments you want to add on this? No, I completely agree. Uh, misfiling uh, among these uh, government bureaucrats is one of our best chances of finding little and significant Easter eggs that could put together pieces of the puzzle and MK ultra is a great example, but you know, I, I found an amazing document in the releases in April of 2023 mm -hmm. uh, as we were preparing for a Lancer presentation. So there are still interesting things coming out and misfiling is always a, <laughs> a very likely scenario to happen when you're dealing with that many documents and yeah the, the people that know the context the researchers that take it seriously will and know what what to look for will be able to pick up on that so right and you know one of the most serious guys i ever heard give an audio presentation about ma the majestic 12 stuff and jfk and aliens and he was about ready to reveal to the american public that it was aliens and this is why the cia had him killed um, one of the most serious guys I ever heard concluded his presentation with a completely anomalous addition, which I think says it all. He, he said, in addition, the, the other thing that he didn't want, you know, that they, they had to cover up was that he was smoking weed with Mary Myers and doing mushrooms with other women. So, you know, I, I don't know what to say, except that that is a more logical reason to cover up things and, and maybe to kill him than this. Because this is based on nothing, <laughs> okay? JFK's drug use, uh, and, and there was drug use in the JFK White House. Um, but, you know, it was generally from this physician, and maybe we can get into that sometime, but not today. Mike, Majestic 12, yeah, I think that's one of the most annoying, ridiculous, and strange things that doesn't seem to want to go away. What, what do you think, Mike? Well, these things get recycled over and over and over again uh, by different people just they don't care if it's real or not they just want attention there you go that could be one motive and god knows what the rest of them are meanwhile we're going to take a quick break here we're going to let mike swanson go but again go to wallstreetwindow.com be in the know wallstreetwindow.com and i highly recommend all the books that mike has written uh you know especially the war state and why the vietnam war and you're working on the uh, second volume in that series now right mike yep that's right so, and uh, we're still looking at a possible release maybe toward the end of the year. Is that, a, is that still a possibility or do you know? Or? It, 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 it won't be this year. <laughs> oh, it won't be this year. Okay. Now, nah, hey, look, you know what it is? Larry Hancock, I think, is going to have a book out uh, not too long from oh, now. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm looking very forward to his uh, reframing, if you will, or Oswald in Three Dimensions, uh, as he mentioned on the show recently. But uh, maybe we'll get Mike's book in 2025 after all the selection nonsense is over with. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get it there, Mike. What, what do you think, next year? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so, too. I'm looking forward to it. And, again, Mike's writing style is great because – it, it takes very complex issues and breaks them down so that even uh, idiots like me can understand them. So highly recommend his books. And, uh, again, you see the red book there on the sidebar at Ocelli.com, The War State. But also, uh, if you're interested in the history of Danville, Virginia, Mike has written a book about that as well. Uh, he's got some other financial-based texts out there, some other stuff. But uh, you can always go to WallStreetWindow.com. And who knows, maybe we'll be talking about uh, – Mike's uh, more recent ventures. Do you want to mention that before we go? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it next time. Oh, next time. You got it. But, uh, yeah, it, it's... Revelation through conversation. WallStreetWindow.com Wall 
gold, silver, the stock market, Wall Street Window. Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com. Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com. Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. The views expressed by callers, co-hosts, or anyone else who happens to get on the air at Ocelli.com do not necessarily reflect the views of Ocelli.com or Chuck Ocelli. And we are not responsible for any stupidity which might ensue. Thank you. In Denial, Secret Wars with Airstrikes and Tanks by Larry Hancock. Secret wars became a staple of U.S. covert operations and are still happening today. Larry Hancock's book, In Denial, rips the cover off many of them. Using new files, it exposes things about the Bay of Pigs that no one has ever written about before. It shows why it really failed and why the United States did not learn from it. It also shows why other countries today are doing secret operations with more success. This is the book that puts what some want to deny into the light. In Denial, Secret Wars with Airstrikes and Tanks. Larry Hancock. For more information, go to Larry-Hancock.com. Pick up your copy of In Denial at Amazon.com in digital or physical form. Ocelli.com. Do you like history? Real history that you were never taught in schools. Why? The Vietnam War. Nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia. By author Mike Swanson. With new documentation never seen before. That'll open your eyes to events that led up to this. Why? The Vietnam War. Nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia. 1945 through 1961. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Why? The Vietnam War by author Mike Swanson. Returning to the second segment of the Ocelli Effect here on a Thor's Day. Yes, it is. And, uh, yeah, the 15th of February, continuing on with JFK Myths 17. And uh, Mike Swanson is not with us now, but I still got Joe Borelli with me and Carmine Savastano. So I'm going to let Carmine continue on uh, regarding part of what it is that he wants to discuss tonight. And uh, and and then we're going to get into uh, something uh of interest that has to do with myths and how people create them and how people propagate them and who might actually be doing that currently. Anyways, um, continue on my uh, Carmine, because look, we're, we're, we're about to touch on one of my favorite characters actually in the JFK land of myths. So, um, you know, continuing on from the Roselli stash and uh, gee, have we not taken care of that yet? Uh, let's, let's go forward. What, what is next, Carmine? Uh, so just to clarify for everyone from before the break, we were discussing, you know, the supposed members of the abort team group posed by Robert Plumley and we had done John Roselli. So next is E. Howard Hunt. And luckily again, we can regard the evidence and quickly dismiss the claims of Plumley and Hunt's verifiable location was quite distant from Dealey Plaza. And again, Ma- by the way, interconnected with Chauncey Hall, interconnected with Judith Barry Baker, interconnected Frank Sturgis, with Frank Sturgis, interconnected with Tosh Plumley seeing it from the other side of the street, interconnected with the three tramps, interconnected. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, all I, these I, I can go on. Stories. Yeah, <laughs> go, go ahead though. <laughs> so, uh, oh, and, many and other times claim independently that Hunt was present in Dealey Plaza, and this likely made him a viable, infamous subject for Plumley to lend his myths credibility, lend his myth credibility. Right, and let's never well, forget the the work of Alex Jones and others who, you know, clearly wanted to show you, and Jim Mars, the late Jim Mars, uh, clearly wanted to show you what the confession of E. Howard Hunt, right? The deathbed confession. Don't forget that. 
uh, mm. from the guy who used to write spy novels, the uh, Watergate guy. Yeah, that E. Howard Hunt. Just, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Um, who later recovered and recanted his confession. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite his deathbed because he didn't die right after being in that bed, though he was pretty sickly. And, you know, maybe his son had certain motivations for bringing that out, not making any judgments or anything. But uh, it is what it was. And, of course, this guy was a fictional writer as well. E. Howard Hunt, that is. Uh, he did. He wrote many spy novels. Uh, you, you can go find them. And, you know, today and anytime. CIA officers, a fairly talented at lying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. E. Howard Hunt. Uh, so, while the House Select Committee on Assassinations photographic studies dispelled some of the Hunt's presence in Dealey Plaza claims, the man himself eluded those seeking his location November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, for decades. In my prior research for his location, I came upon several internal agency documents that support Hunt was an improbable agent for use in JFK's assassination. Several CIA reports note that Hunt did not travel in the period of the assassination and did not take sick leave. They also noted his financial records supported this premise. Yet E. Howard Hunt, never one to divulge the truth of his own accord, had made claims found to be false in court under questioning by Mark Lane. He claimed being at home on the morning of the assassination and went shopping with his wife later that day. Hmm. He was lying, of course. And right. while Lane and others believe that Hunt's deception was to conceal a link to the JFK case, according to then classified agency files, it was to conceal his true location, secretly meeting officials in one Cuban exile about overthrowing Fidel Castro. The HSCA record states on November 22nd, Hunt, Agency Inspector General Lyman Kirkpatrick, Deputy Director for Plans Richard Helms, and Cuban exile Harry Ruiz Williams were meeting at headquarters regarding an anti-Castro planning, and it was this Hunt attempted to conceal. Despite the confusion and dishonesty on E. Howard Hunt's part, the record clearly states he, like Tosh Plumlee, Johnny Roselli, and Richard Nagel, have no verifiable connection to President Kennedy's assassination. Mm. And when you're talking about Mark Lane and questioning him in court, you're clearly discussing the Liberty Lobby case where yeah. E. Howard Hunt sued them over claiming that he was president in Dealey Plaza, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. People have tried to make him one of the three tramps, and then they've also tried to make him a guy who's uh, – uh, out there in in this really uh really kind of stylish hat for 1963, uh you know dressed in a really interesting way, <laughs> supposedly present in Dealey Plaza for God knows what reason, um, yeah. You know they they never quite give a reason except I I don't know if anybody's ever claimed that he's a shooter directly. Is he supposed to be a shooter? Well, I don't think he was. He was more of a uh, counterintelligence, intelligence gathering. I don't think he was really skilled with weapons. That's not. I haven't seen that in any of his files anyway. Well, no, but you're you're. Might have had some basic training, but yeah, but you're talking about the reality. I'm asking about the myth because oh, you know, <laughs> to, I'm sure somewhere he's a shooter. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in somebody's story somewhere. You know, literally, just like John Hankey never says in his video that George H.W. Uh, Bush has a gun in his hand, but he does show a picture of George H.W. Bush with a gun in his hand. During his presentation. So and, you know, no no possible historical evidence to show that uh, George H.W. knows probably anything more than basic training methods for firing a weapon. So, I mean, I'm just saying I'm just saying I don't think anybody's tried to put a gun in his hand directly. He was supposed to be a, a, an observer, a guy watching, uh, keeping the troops in line, so to speak. Right. Uh, Supposedly until, you know, we debunk that. <laughs> With, I believe, uh, uh, Steve Rowe is the gentleman who produced the uh, picture that showed him in Tyler, Texas, when everybody said he was in Dealey Plaza. Oh, yeah, H.W. Bush, right. Where where, yeah. where was George Bush during the assassination? Where was Barbara Bush during – well, it so happens yeah. he was at a Kiwanis Club <laughs> meeting. But yep. uh, anyway. That's you know. independently verified through a book and other sources. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and there's, uh, well. <laughs> and there's photographic proof of him giving a lunch – again, a lunch yep. – time discussion he's at a luncheon for the kiwanis yeah. club which by the way lands in about that area where kennedy was in dealey plaza around lunchtime okay uh, yeah so unless he has magic <laughs> bit of distance plaza. bit of distance he couldn't cover that distance at that time <laughs> uh you know i mean unless you want to tell me that uh you know the stephen king thing is correct and somebody went back in time and portaled him over there i don't know maybe but okay. uh yeah so <laughs> go, go, go ahead i, I okay so uh, four men were named uh, th those are all the which I think are unnecessary to the plot people <laughs> who are kind of somehow the glue that holds together all of these many stories so as far as the assassins four men were named in the highly quote highly educated guess 
as the Assassins in Dealey Plaza by the podcast series, and they are identified as, quote, cold-blooded assassins. In my view, that is two men too many for an effective plot, but we, as we have noted, four assassins is still a conservative number in comparison to even more improbable popular scenarios, a la Fetzer and 14. So, yeah. And you've just are... been reined. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. The, uh, the number arrived at for assassins seems in many cases to be arbitrary and likely inflated. Three would at least cleave to using a triangulation of fire, but in my view, three is still possibly too many. If the plot was to be successful, it would rely on a minimum of compartmentalized participants, and this would assist in preventing discovery and concealing the plot. Nevertheless, these are the men named responsible. The first alleged killer was Herminio Diaz Garcia, a Cuban exile that was identified by Fabian Escalante, a former Cuban intelligence officer. Escalante stated that Garcia was a gangster, and it appears the word of this intelligence agent is considered worthwhile on not just his gangster affiliations, but also that he was one of the assassins. The series fails to offer any real background on this mysterious person, so I decided to do so for them. Hmm. Sandalio Herminio Diaz Garcia, a.k.a. Herminio Diaz Garcia, was a member of the 30th of November anti-Castro Cuban exile group headquartered in Miami. Among the reasons Garcia is an unlikely assassin is because evidence verifies he did not arrive in the United States until July of 1963 and spent his time forming a small anti-Castro squad, made underworld racketeering contacts, and was, like several notable exiles, debriefed by the Central Intelligence Agency during September of 1963 to gain intelligence regarding Cuba. Mm. Garcia, during his interview, would state among his eventual goals was, goals was the assassination of Fidel Castro. This quickly prompted agency officials to state, quote, we dropped contact with him at that time and never did have an operational relationship with him. <laughs> and referring back to what Chuck said about Roselli. <laughs> Needless mm -hmm. to say, the agency didn't have the greatest past association trying to use criminals <laughs> to kill mm -hmm. Castro. Yeah, they had some troubles <laughs> there. And, you know, it, it's interesting, by the way, just the use of the word gangster uh, in this very general kind of open way is is mm -hmm. fascinating to me because – People read into that in all sorts of different ways. It's interpreted in very different ways. Matter of fact, when I first read that guy's name, I thought maybe they were adding a nickname to it because Hermano is, uh, what, uh, Spanish for brother, right? So, you know, Hermano, maybe they're saying it's like brother, you know, I, I don't know, nickname, street name, possibly. Um, but it, it, it also vaguely resembles some of what, uh, Dean Anderson was uh, uh, saying, Dean Andrews, excuse me, was saying, right? Mm -hmm. When he said, yeah. I don't know, I pulled names out of the thin air, you know, in his jazz talk uh, yeah. where, where he gave up all these different, uh, let's just call them Hispanic sounding names, uh, supposedly to Garrison, he, you know, famously John Candy in the uh, movie says, I just gave him whatever name popped into my cabeza. Um, I, <laughs> sorry. I just on. would have loved to have been in the room when the agency officials were questioning him and he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill Castro. And they're just like, oh, boy. <laughs> Right, you know. Oh, do we know this one, Pally? <laughs> you don't even know that we got operations going on right now while yeah. we're talking to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, oh, okay. Yeah, one of so, these guys, gotcha. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Based on the ongoing CIA attempts on Castro's life in that period, Garcia's open discussion of assassination, it makes some sense to distance themselves from this seemingly loose-lipped figure. Plus, he said it in the first interview. It's like, hi, guys, I want to kill Castro. Right. Maybe that's not the best agent to be secretive with. Anyway, you know, you, so, you're, you're there uh, for your intake interview at CIA and you say, hey, uh, who do I talk to about running cocaine? Um, yeah, no. Now that you'll see he actually had a little bit of familiarity with. <laughs> that's why I brought it up. Go ahead. <laughs> so the agency uh, had the Amlash plot underway when Garcia made his declaration. And he was not required to execute their future operations. They also did not have a great record of attempting to use criminals, as we've spoken before, a la Johnny Roselli. The FBI notes possessing a useful Cuban exile informant near the end of October with contacts to both mafia boss Santo Traficante and criminals within the exile community. Garcia stated waiting a while after seeking asylum for other anti-Castro groups to assassinate the Cuban dictator before years later acting himself. Mm. Um, Sandalio, according to documents, was eventually a bodyguard of Bob Boss Santo Traficante, smuggled drugs, sold weapons, and this adheres to reports of his past criminal history. However, all this recorded activity and officials tracking him 
would leave scant time and opportunity to undertake a clandestine assassination just months following his arrival to America. Right. I mean, if you want to believe, you want to believe, but you better hit the ground running if you get here in July. Then you got to go through all the rigmarole of applying for asylum, of finding somewhere to live, of orchestrating your family. You know, and at the same time, he's committing crimes and making deals with racketeers and being interviewed by the CIA. He was busy. Right. <laughs> To, unless we get some evidence, I, I see no reason why this is the guy. But I'm trying to give people actual background on him, not just a story. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, the aforementioned FBI informant would identify Garcia's association to the mafia amongst 1964. Garcia did participate in exile operations targeting Cuba during the middle of the 1960s, according to files, and they reveal he committed and withdrew from at least one paramilitary assassination operation. Not sanctioned by the CIA, just Cuban exiles trying to take out Castro on their own. Mm. Uh, subsequent government sources offer that Sandiala was killed on a beach with other exiles during a failed operation targeting Cuba amid 1966. The goal of the failed operation was the assassination of Fidel Castro, and notably, Garcia was said to plan the act by using his, quote, thirty-eight caliber pistol with a silencer. This failure to even get close to his target, his inconsistent commitment to operations and choice of weapon further do not lend themselves to Garcia being an effective assassin. Remember, no evidence is presented by the series, but Garcia is merely endorsed upon the word of a prior Direccion General de Inteligencia DGI official suggestion. And I find this quite deficient. Additionally notable is that Escalante believed the Maurice Bishop story of Antonio Viciana, who claimed that David Atlee Phillips and J. Walton Moore at differing times were Bishop, which, like so many other ideas in this podcast series, is not reliable. Lacking significant documentation or several corroborating sources that can be verified, I see no reason why this particular exile is more likely an assassin than any other, quote, daring figure. Exiles such as Manolo Ray with his own autonomously functioning group and several others leading exiles incensed with the Kennedy administration's failure to free Cuba would also possess a greater motive and means to conspire. As Russell states, this is just a name, their best guess, but a proven assassin. Hmm. So uh, there, there you have it, and that, that final statement boils it down pretty well. And you've just been reined. So, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, that's a, that's a fairly good roundup. So, uh, Carmine has a lot more information and believe it, there's going to be an 18, 19 and 20 of this series one way or another. <laughs> so as we, uh, continue on with 17, I want to turn our attention to something else because, um, there might be a couple of points of contention that, uh, I don't know. I might have never paid any attention to had I not been at Lancer this past year. And why is that? Well, ultimately, it concludes with a clip I'm going to play for you here. And we're going to get an explanation from Joe because, you know, Carmine presented at Lancer, but he did it via remote and with a pre-recorded presentation. Joe was there, even though there was a pre-recorded presentation with him and Rob uh, at Lancer. But uh, but he bore witness to some things that went on with, uh, let's call them another podcast. <laughs> And ultimately, it uh, concludes, the story concludes, we're going to go back to front on this one, okay? Uh, the story concludes with this clip here that I'm going to play, uh, which I was sent just prior to showtime. Uh, the Lone Gunman podcast accused your show of ripping them off in the first 90 seconds of their last podcast. Who? Why so spicy? Who? I, I saw this, it came in before the show. Who are they? It, it's, there's a podcast called the Lone Gunman podcast. Okay. I did find it, and I found a show, and there's like a micro clip where you stated that, um, oh, God, we were just talking about him. The, the, uh, the David guy. David Atlee Phillips? Not David Atlee Phillips, but Mr. X. Who Mr. Fletcher, X is. Fletcher Prouty? Yeah, that Fletcher Prouty was a maniac, Scientologist, etc. Well, I didn't say he was a maniac. I said he was a Scientologist. No, 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 but you said this guy's a maniac. He was a Scientologist. But it was just off the cuff. Statement. Oh, okay. And they pulled this, there's this little snippet and an Oscar Wilde quote that they say, the imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I've never but, even heard of these people. I, I know. I, I really don't understand it. And honestly, I wouldn't watch it because it's the Lone Gunman podcast. Who they gives a shit about these yeah. people? Let's move on. Fuck yeah. these people. Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right. Uh, 
So that is the way that uh, America's Untold Stories answered a question from a chatter on YouTube <laughs> about the idea that, uh, you know, maybe maybe there's something, oh, by the way, they're not familiar with, never heard of these people. You met them at Lancer, um, and there was an interesting meeting at Lancer for one of the figures, and I can't remember who's supposed to be the comedian between the two of them. One of them is supposedly a comedian, and I think the other one is the researcher. I think that's the story. Uh, Robert, Mark Robert, uh, we call him Gruber, okay. is uh, the storyteller. Okay. And I'm stressing that word storyteller. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other guy, um, Eric Hunley, is more of the tech guy that just lets Mark talk the whole episode. And their podcast is called America's Untold Stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what they do. They tell stories and we'll hear a clip of shortly of one of their stories they told. But after they told us to go F ourselves, of course, Rob and I had to respond. And on episode 273, we devoted almost 25 minutes to their shenanigans. Uh, Rob tore apart them on their Preferred episode because Rob has been uh, one of the few people who has dived into Larry Crayford. Uh, they didn't say the name right, but it's it's crazy. And then they don't even do the research or the you know takes two minutes to find out that we're not a lone gunman based podcast. And it's kind of an ironic title now that there's two people. <laughs> co-hosting uh it's in theory should be the lone gun men but it's even more ironic and they they just don't get it and uh they're too lazy and they're storytellers and uh they uh they poke the bear eh, look fair enough and they're 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 semi-popular on youtube fair enough uh and they made their presence known at the lancer conference uh, now, we have a 30-second clip of how they made their presence known at the Lancer Conference. Despite the fact that this went on for quite a while, there was a, a bit of disturbance while people were speaking on stage, and there was difficulty with people being able to hear in the back of the hall during the live presentations. And uh, in, indeed, my co-host on Friday nights was also involved in this event <laughs> that went on during the event. Uh, where, you know, people felt that they were quite entitled to behave any which way they wanted to in a public space because, I guess, alcohol was being served. And, you know, when you're rock stars of the YouTube, then you're rock stars. So this is kind of an example of their... We do have audio, thanks to Doug Campbell, um, of, of Huntley being disrespectful at the Dallas conference, and here it is. Nobody can hear it. Okay, all that crap is going on in the back. At first you heard Rob Clark's voice uh, in introducing yeah. this, and obviously this is a clip from either Quick Hits or Lone Gunman. Which is it from? Lone Gunman. Lone Gunman. Yep. And uh, it, yeah. it came in a little fuzzy, but uh, essentially, essentially some guy stood up. Uh, Hunley was in the back corner of the room. You know what I'm talking about, Chuck. You yep. were there yep. where you couldn't really see the stage. And he had his little group of uh, minions around him. And they were drunkenly being disrespectful during the banquet, which, you know, featured... Robert Groden and um, Deborah Conway spoke at the Deborah banquet. Conway. That's exactly where it happened. I or it was that or, or Groden, but uh, yeah, someone literally stood up and told them to shut the f up because you're being disrespectful. And uh, Grobear, the other uh, host of America Unsold Stories, was not even listening. Was outside behind the bar. Uh, with his own little group telling his own little stories, even with his fascination with the Zapruder film, 
had no interest of listening to uh, Grodin, and they eventually got kicked out and went down to the bar and got kicked out of there, and it was just a whole mess. And, right. Well, two of the guys, and, two guys at a table adjacent to them in the back, one of them was my co-host on Friday nights, B. Pete, the tall guy in the blue shirt and the hat with the glasses. That was B. Pete. Yes. Uh, I remember him well. And uh, I'm not sure if it was him or the guy next to him, like, uh, literally was like, look, we we can, we can uh, you know, settle this outside if you want uh, kind of situations here. <laughs> Okay, which would have been interesting because we were on the 11th floor. Um, You know, so I don't know if they would have had to take the elevator to go outside with it or what, but it did seem to calm down a bit after this. But this this carrying on, this noise, was being made again during presentations at the banquet, uh, you know, where awards were given. Deborah did a special thing uh, about, you know, women women that are gone that contributed to the case. Uh, Robert Grodin. almost, Almost in tears. It was just so disrespectful. Well, because one of them was her sister. You know, that's the first thing that right. really moved her. Uh, but she also worked with Mary Farrell and, you know, so on and so forth and was was doing that. Bob Groden did a presentation. Uh, Larry Hancock did a presentation. Um, anyway, it, it was the banquet actually ran kind of long, the presentations and all that, that night. Uh, but part of what was going on there is people in the back couldn't hear. And you're hearing the arguments about that in that clip. So that's what that was all together. Uh, meanwhile, there's also a, a short thing on YouTube. Um, maybe you want to explain that clip real fast before we play it for people. But I, I have an ultimate sure. conclusion on America's Untold Stories uh, when we're done wrapping this up. So go ahead and explain this uh, short on YouTube, please. Great. Well, uh, this is one of the shorts. And, of course, shorts on YouTube are made to get views so they're a little extra ridiculous but this one was just so ridiculous so out of control and just so uh i I don't even have the words for it and i'll let you play it and then i want to get carmine's uh reaction to it and it links very nicely to the um nexus of madness that Carmine was just discussing, too, because, you know, the abort mission and the secondary plots and, you know, the people that don't necessarily know what the plan of the assassination was, but somehow know what the backup and abort plots were. Um, it's interesting. You don't know what you're aborting, but you know there was an abort team. You don't know what it is that was being plotted exactly, but you know about the second plot that didn't go off um, or the backup plans you know about, but not the initial plans. I always find that interesting, but anyway, here's that clip. If it'll play it for us, let's see. Uh, hmm. Okay, sorry if you already answered this question. After Kennedy was shot, but he survived, was there a black backup plan to make sure he didn't leave the hospital alive? I don't, that, I don't know. The backup plan was to go, uh, Peter, the, um, sorry about your loss, by the way. Um, the backup plan was to go to the LBJ ranch the following day. Uh, where he would never have been allowed to escape. There was a fundraising barbecue. Very few people know about this. A Democratic fundraiser uh, scheduled for the LBJ Ranch uh, on Sunday. And I, from what I understand, there was a plan uh, there uh, with multiple snipers to not let him leave the ranch. Okay. <laughs> from what I understand, there was a backup plan there the next day. Because if you had an aborted attack or a partial attack that was unsuccessful in Dealey Plaza, I'm sure plans wouldn't have changed, by the way. Uh, but I guess assuming that nothing happened and nobody saw anything and the Secret Service wasn't tipped and nobody caught wind of anything at all, eh, they'll get him the next day. Maybe so, but maybe again, you know, and I've heard other people discuss this about, well, There were actually shooters that were getting ready to be there at the trademark, which was the ultimate destination. When they would have stopped moving, they would have been there for the next speech. There were shooters there. There were shooters, what, back at Love Field? We're going to hit Fetzer numbers soon. Well, we're we're already past Fetzer numbers, aren't we? Because, I mean, how many teams do you have to assemble between spotters, radio guys, shooters, extra tramps, uh, witnesses? People claim that people were put in position to make films and take pictures. I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, Carmine, and, and, go ahead. 
as, as like most of these things, unfortunately, well, not fortunately because it's so ridiculous, <laughs> but as most of these things fortunately work out, they fall apart because it's just too many people. You cannot keep a secret amongst that many people. Hmm. You just can't. I mean, we've seen it through le- just leaks in the last, let's say, 20 years. I mean, it was less frequent then, but there still were leaks, and there still were people that, you know, spoke out properly, like Ellsberg, like Mike mentioned earlier. So you were going to get something, as, as Larry said in one of his, uh, named one of his books, someone would have talked. Mm. Chances are, yeah, someone, if, if a direct link to the assassination existed still, chances are they're dead. And as I and Chuck have dis- discussed before, just, you know, in discussing, you know, postulating on what would have happened if these conspirators had a brain in their head, the assassins were dead within a week. They were sent on vacation. <laughs> mm-hmm. And when they arrived, there were people waiting for them. Yeah, yeah. Because, either either that or you figure out a way to get them all on one plane that never makes its destination. You know, yeah, something yeah, nice like this. Yeah, nice small engine, nice, nice Cessna. Nice little Buddy Holly killing plane. You know, something like that. And, yeah, it's all over with. And, I mean, accidents happen. Um, I mean, these are masterminds. So you got to think a mastermind is going to be a few steps ahead. Mm-hmm. If that's, you know, someone that could contrive the plot that I would think most reasonable people that look into this case are thinking of is a mastermind. Well, see, here's the problem with someone would have talked as a phrase, by the way. No offense to Larry Hancock, actually uh, uh, praise and honor to the man. But quite frankly, uh, let's get down to it. If someone did talk, here's what it's lost in. The soup of crap that is now out there with the alleged claims, with the people that are talking that are misleading you, with the storytellers, if you will. The storytellers, if you will. Okay. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> that yep. are out there, yep. uh, what doing what? Muddying the water, giving you the idea that they have a story to tell. Storytellers. Interesting. Because the guy told me he was a comedian, by the way, and I had an exchange back and forth with what? him. Uh, by the way, I am not an official member or anything connected to the Lone Gunman podcast, which, you know, the guy's like, oh, F them because of the name of the podcast anyway. As per usual, don't listen to it or examine what it is you're talking about because that would be consistent with your behavior. Obviously. And I get it. Exactly. Exactly. So and which the of the two? Part... Well, go ahead, I'm Joe. Sorry. Let, let, let okay. Joe speak on this, please. <laughs> go mm-hmm. ahead. Joe. Okay. So the fun, the funny part about it is you actually mentioned the words Liberty Lobby in uh, a few minutes ago, right? right? So it's an inside joke within the Lone Gubman podcast that Rob has trouble saying Liberty Lobby and sometimes says Liberty Lobby. Okay. And it's a, I'm sure you're aware, Carmine. It's been a years long joke. And Grobert, on one of his recent episodes on Prouty or something, said Liberty Lobbity. And we <laughs> played th- we played that as a joke. Nice. So one of the mutual listeners uh essentially made a a super chat that wasn't really accurate that that claim we were hijacking something while ironically they uh their episode was on ed butler the the inca guy and they had played some of oswald's radio and um television interviews which we had uploaded a week and a half before so if anyone was hijacking anything it wasn't us and just because rob decided to bring me on as a co-host and because we decided to take it live uh, does not mean we hijacked anything. It's completely out of context. And then we tore them apart for half an hour because of their ignorance. Okay. So to respond to the thing that you played, yes, that was disrespectful, inappropriate. If they really had something to say, they would have, you know, tried to present or they would have tried to offer a, contrary view in some sort of forum rather than just scream like idiots in the back of a room while you were talking i looked up Gru- so gruber is the guy that did this gruber is the guy that said fuck these guys yeah uh, so well he is a writer who has been in a few movies and national lampoon 
Yeah, he wrote uh, for the National editor. Lampoon. Yeah, L.A. Weekly, wrote, wrote High Times, time. Penthouse, yeah. MTV. So he's he's a he's a pseudo celebrity. So he thinks that you know because of his pseudo celebrity status <laughs> that he should he's correct <laughs> rather than you guys who actually produce evidence and <laughs> leave your minds open to new ideas. <laughs> Exactly. Interesting. Interesting. He's talking about Ed Butler too, because Butler's uh, is just for the listeners' edification. That's one of the guys who was involved in Lee Harvey Oswald's interviews in uh, New Orleans uh, in in six in the summer of '63 after he got arrested with Carlos Berenguer for his you know FPCC Fair Play for Cuba Committee uh, distribution of uh, pamphlets, right, uh, and all that. You know, where he ends up uh, going and taking his, like a $10 fine or something like that. I forget how much it was. It wasn't much. Uh, you know, and, and that arrest for disturbing the peace out there, right? So he gets invited to uh, two radio things, uh, one radio, one TV, really. Uh, the Latin Listening Post and then WDSU TV uh, Conversation Cavalcade or something like that. I, I forget. But anyway. Carte Blanche. Carte Blanche. That's it. Thank you. Uh, conversation Carte Blanche. There it is. Um but either way, uh, Butler is uh, what the the interviewer who uh, is trying to deal with the uh, debate between him and Baron Gare, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, the the other guy. Well, he also reminds Stucky. me of Vernon. Yeah. Well, Stucky <laughs> is a, got that Hollywood background. Yeah, and Stucky's the guy with the uh, with the uh, Latin listening post uh, uh, thing, mm -hmm. you know, for people that yeah, are, Bill Stucky. Bill Stucky, right? So, I mean, uh, yeah, so there you go. And those things are, you know, out there. You can find them, download them uh, from somewhere online. Uh, plus the little clips from WDSU-TV where he's interviewed briefly about the events. Um, right. And, and uh, these were these were even released on uh, uh, vinyl records in the uh, 1960s and 70s, I think. So, a anyway, it's just something to point out to the listeners. Uh, he was discussing that now. On to Prouty, and, you know, Prouty's a Scientologist and whatever. Prouty is connected to Liberty Lobby, um, and I don't have trouble saying it. Now I probably will at some point mix, mix it up because of this. Uh, <laughs> but it happens, uh, much like I kept saying Patricia instead of Priscilla, but, you know, things yeah, happen. It McMillan. McMillan, it, right. It, ha it happens. It uh, it does, especially when you're going over and over stuff. And uh, but But anyway. America's untold stories. You know, there might be a reason why some of those stories are untold. And I get it. There is a lane for true crime podcasting out there. And you don't have to do much outside of go into the headlines or know much about the case. Right away, by the way, when the guy is asked, do you know about this? He says the most honest thing up front, which is, I don't know, because he doesn't. He's heard a rumor. He's heard a speculation from somebody about maybe since they were going to go to the LBJ ranch at some point during the Texas trip, maybe he was going to get killed there. And people he are contradicted. He contradicted himself in his own response. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but he gave an honest response to start with, you know, the excited utterances of people should always be observed when they're first confronted with a question. Just well, and saying. that's, that's added nonsense. Cause everyone knows the best myth is the Murchison ranch. <laughs> Well, that was my next. Where point. they have the party beforehand. Yeah. I mean, that how much of a a steal from that story is this new <laughs> day after they had guys set up? I mean, once again, Lyndon Johnson, not a mastermind. No, but you have <laughs> a, to expand. A vile criminal, certain. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a, a criminal. Of I mean, all Matt sorts. Wallace. Mac Wallace could have been in the Bushes Carmine. Let's not <laughs> yeah. rule that out. Let's not <laughs> rule that out completely. Even though we've been over that on this show, and oh, again, yeah. I point yeah. you to uh, no, Fa the Faustian bargain. Oh no, no, no Joe, course, it's okay. Of course, yeah. I point you to the Faustian bargain, the book by Joan Mellon. Uh, you know, it, it, where where she decided to what go and actually get some uh primary evidence and have it examined by an actual expert and double check the whole thing about Mac Wallace. His yep. fingerprint being present on the uh, sixth floor of the school and book depository. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Carmine, what did you say? I was just going to say, and as Chuck's about to say, it was not. Yeah. When you actually check the records and you see that, I believe also the person who originally made the claim in the men who killed Kennedy had no license at the time, had looked at a Xerox copy, not an actual original. Right. And on and on and on. Just things weren't done. And that's why these bad ideas continue to exist. Whereas Joan Mellon went and had, you know, had the uh, fingerprint evidence acquired that was collected at the time. Guess what? Mac Wallace was inducted into the military and utilized that particular 
a copy of his fingerprints for the comparison and gave it to a guy who used to instruct people directly about fingerprint evidence. <laughs> Okay, uh, who went and got, uh, again, a copy of the photograph to examine, you know, so on and so forth. And that's all laid out in the uh, appendix to that book, Faustian Bargain. Look it up. It's the Mac Wallace story, which, quite honestly, was not the, the story that she should have written if she was really interested in selling books or making the waves in the podcast community. Um, she really should have written a book that framed Mac Wallace because that would have been a whole lot more acceptable, sold a lot more books, you know, like the guy who literally did, and I'm witness to it, threatened her directly, Roger Stone, who gets away with threatening people all the time, whether they're witnesses he's attempting to intimidate and gets pardoned for, or it happens to be a JFK writer that disagrees with his crap. Um, you know, one way or another, uh, his book, and uh, let me see, who else? Oh, yeah, the blood, money, and power thing, and that, that whole bit. Uh, what was that guy's name? Bar McClellan. Bar McClellan. Thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, these are all worthy <laughs> I mentions. I wish I didn't remember some of these things. I, I wish I didn't too. <laughs> but these are all worthy of mentions because tonight's topic is the myths, and I figure we might as well get in as many as possible. But ultimately, <laughs> America's untold stories. Maybe there's a reason why they're untold, and maybe you ought to stick to your true crime headlines and not try and present yourselves as experts because your expertise, and I don't call myself an expert, by the way. But your expertise is not even up to the standard of the blind guy on the microphone right now. Okay, just saying, just saying, and I've only got a high school diploma. Granted, I'm not a comedian or a great speaker, as you and I exchanged barbs there in uh, in Lancer Proves. But uh, again, you know. If it's all about attitude and popularity on YouTube, you win. I got it. But, uh, you know, what what can I say? <laughs> well, and I, I would say in response to that, at least, everyone that did take part in the cover-up we can prove had a degree. So congratulations. There you go. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess it means <laughs> more well-educated people are willing to lie under questioning. <laughs> Yeah. And destroy the legal record at times. Right. So, uh, look, it's not just the man, the you know, who killed Kennedy, which, by the way, ironically, is the same title they used on that PBS special in, uh, what was it, 88, around the 25th anniversary that David Lipton played a big part in. Um, oh, somebody reused that title? Well, that's what they call it. Who killed, who killed JFK? Oh, right? yeah. Who killed, almost. Yeah, yeah. They just didn't say the men. Yeah. They just said who killed Kennedy. They barred, they barred part of it. Oh, Cause yeah. I was actually, like I told you, I was going to try to lay out, uh, th- some of these guys in, in an article, like just try to take apart the people that we know for sure weren't there just so we can put them to bed at least as well as we can. But I, w- I was still toying with the men who didn't kill Kennedy. <laughs> well, no, no, no. That, that's, look, you're, you're, hang on. I want to get this straight for everybody listening. I'm actually talking about the PBS special on No. Oh, yeah, yeah, the original. Yeah, the original. That was called Who Killed JFK? Exactly the same title oh. that uh, Reiner used. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I thought you were talking about the men who killed Kennedy. Okay. Yeah, no, I didn't know that there was it. So he just totally lifted it. Though. Yeah, he completely lifted from the 1988 uh, special uh, for Is, that was on PBS. And I'm sure that Rob Reiner had seen the PBS special because he's a PBS kind of guy and you know come on boys let's make our escape <laughs> there you go I mean I, I'm just I, saying yeah I was going to ask um did you want to discuss more of that or do you mind if I I have a couple more assassins <laughs> well Joe I, I have a question for you because you guys might have I, I can't sit through these guys you know and their podcast and their their mm-hmm. their uh, uh, ego thing that they do on YouTube I can't sit through their stuff um, have you guys taken a look at any more of their alleged work on JFK that they were so interested in that they had to make a presentation at Lancer? Which, by the way, I did everything in my power, regardless of how obnoxious they were, to make their appearance work because I was the MC, And I even ran around, got them a table at the last moment. I was trying to get everything straight and set for them and all that good stuff, accommodate them as best I could as part of the uh, team running the event there. Um you know, and, and and didn't feel as though that respect was being repaid back to the event or myself or anybody else. But nonetheless, oh. I attempted to be a good host of sorts, a good master of ceremonies, as was my job that day. But uh, I'm curious. And you were. Any other evaluations? You Thank you. But any other evaluations about uh, their presentation well, or other 
podcasts they've done. I mean, have they given us anything good or have they given us just a bunch of crap? I mean, Proudy was a Scientologist and he was, he was nuts. No, he wasn't nuts, but he was a Scientologist. Was Proudy a misrepresented character? Has he been over dramatized as somebody of, uh, importance that maybe he wasn't? Yeah. Yeah, he was. And, uh, the guy who actually does the kind of job that Proudy describes doing. And I'm not saying that he wasn't, uh, a liaison and he wasn't somebody who was, you know, working under some of the things that he describes and so on and so forth. But as per usual, when somebody's celebrity grows, so does their importance and their stories evolve. And I think that happened to Fletcher Prouty as he aged. That is my words, my ideas about Fletcher Prouty. But I mean, have they done a presentation about Prouty that was good or anything else they've, that you know of? Good. They've, they've published as to my knowledge, nothing regarding the JFK assassination uh, in any type of research form. As you well know, their topic was A.I. Oswald, mm -hmm. thinking that A.I. could uh, solve the case. Uh, I was not at that presentation. I skipped it and went to Dealey Plaza with Doug Campbell, Doug Campbell and uh, Monica Jimenez Perez, which was the best decision of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I can't speak to their presentation. I heard it was more of a Q and A, and um, they had their own little uh, posse's after after that, and they were very dis disrespectful. And I don't think they contributed anything substantial or useful to. Mm -hmm anything regarding this case whatsoever fair enough look and 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 in here i go i got to do the devil's advocate thing because it's my show and that's what i do um i would say that you know the use of an ai program to attempt to sort through the actual evidence might be of interest it might be an interesting idea. It might be something that would get us to uh, sort through a whole bunch of stuff like collating all those documents that I told you the bureaucracy was way too uh, bloated to deal with, like turning around and matching these things together and coming up with composites that would reveal certain things in the documentation, come up with answers to various aspects of the case. Very much so. Mm -hmm. I think this could be a useful thing and a useful idea. But I think yeah. I think you would be right if that AI program had context, you need to study this case for years and years and years to get the context. You might read a document uh, five years ago and then read it again yesterday and uh, pick out some tidbit that you would have never known five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think... I think there could be some advantages to it, right. but I I don't think it could solve the case. I, I don't think the documents exist for AI to do it, and I don't think it has the context necessary to do it. Well, look, again, uh, something that is a force multiplier, I think, could be of interest and definitely get us to certain resolutions about some things and come up with some clarity regarding certain stuff. And it's not just about feeding documents into it, although part of that context would be based on what it is you decide to feed into it and what it is you decide not to feed into it. Um, exactly. But there exactly. are possibilities here. I mean, so I'm just saying it's not a bad idea to think. How can we, again, adapt a new technology to the old case? I think it's not a bad idea. But, you know, trying to figure out what these guys have actually contributed and uh, basically understanding that they utilized an event which was meant to focus on a case of interest, not necessarily a particular author, uh, a particular ego, a particular group of people or anything like that. Um, I think these guys used it as a, uh, you know, public appearance, an event for them, for their podcast. And I, I don't know what to say, except that you're right. You're right. And they now are doing their own private events. So them and their minions, you know, they have like almost 100, I think 108,000 followers on YouTube. Right. Probably more on, on other platforms. If you think 1% of those go to those events. They don't need to to 
interact with the research community because they know they can't, uh, you know, conversate with them. They can't debate critically with them. So they're going to do their own thing and they're going to live in their own little world and they're going to tell their own stories, emphasis on America's untold stories. Mm -hmm. And Robert is a great storyteller and I give him credit for getting some people involved or interested in the JFK assassination. I think there are positives to what they have done and I think uh, a lot of what they say is is true, but significant part isn't, mm. and that's the part the sensationalism part where they sensationalize sensationalize certain aspects for clicks, for views, for money, and obviously Rob, I, Carmine, you, we are very much research. And document based. So that is the difference. Yeah. Look, and, and, uh, as per usual, credit where credit's due, they're doing pretty well as far as it is, you know, uh, making a YouTube channel work for them on their behalf. And I wish them all the best of luck, but I think they're better off doing their own thing and not trying to, uh, you know, go into the fray that is the research community, which has problems of its own and, uh, doesn't need this. So, you know, much as I appreciated their, their appearance and their, uh, you know, seeming, seeming, uh, uh, attempt to raise awareness for the conference and, uh, you know, a very serious issue and all that. Um, uh, what can I say? I, I, I would say that the people that take them seriously, well, you know what? That's on you. Uh, what can I tell you? Uh, well, you know, look, I, I make mistakes and whatnot, but, uh, my efforts are not about pushing my own name out there. They're not about, you know, raising awareness for a general story that needs to be told um, without trying to find the best way to certain uh, obscured evidence and things like that. When it comes to any of the things that I discuss on this show, I try and get at the things that maybe you're not hearing elsewhere. But uh, but I always go after that, which I think is based uh, best in the reality, not necessarily the official story, not necessarily the junk food that is the media, and definitely not the uh, strangeness that was much better focused and did feature some interesting people, uh, you know, like the Who Killed JFK podcast. But uh, and, and it sounds like, you know, we've now devolved into criticizing other podcasters. No, it's about the information they're putting out. What is the value of the information America's Untold Stories put out? Uh, if you can find the value in it, do me a favor, write to me, info at ocelli.com. Show it to me. I, I don't see it. Uh, but then again, with the uh, Rob Reiner thing, it's a, it's a whole composite of uh, just, wow, static and stuff. And you've just been Reiner. And that. So anyway, Carmine, is there anything that we should close on here or should we come? you know, conclude this episode of uh, JFK myths. Uh, if yeah. you don't mind, I'll burn through these three assassins. <laughs> How about that, Joe? Then what? we can put that to bed and never have to <laughs> revisit Rob Pryor's series. What, what do you say? We, we burn through yes, the burn last away. three assassins <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, finish up with the Rob Reiner section. Again, this is not about them personally or anything like that. Uh, although, you know, you guys might take it personal at the Lone Gunman. Uh, the Lone Gunman podcast uh you might take it very seriously uh and personally but i don't it's just i i think they're just out there for a different purpose and uh you know what god bless you man no, what right. can i say no and yeah. and and we don't but then when they told us to go f ourselves we you know you know rob uh carmine knows rob uh i have a similar personality to rob and we weren't addressing their comment their content we were talking about how funny it was that they said Liberty Lobbity and then they told us to go F ourselves. Then we went off on them for their obvious BS. You know, we, we knew what they were from the beginning, which was just a storytelling podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, they, Grobear says he's been researching for 50 years and, oh, uh, very well, apparently. <laughs> 
Uh, you know, no. look, you can you can do uh, yeah, you one can piece. Do of... things wrong forever, and that doesn't necessarily mean that lends any credence to what you say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look, I I, I know uh, I know somebody personally that's been driving for about fifty years, and quite honestly, they've been in so many accidents I've lost count. It doesn't mean <laughs> they did it well for the past fifty years, but they have survived. Uh, so it is what it is, and I still can't remember which one of them is the comedian. But anyway, it is what it is. Okay, go ahead, Karma. <laughs> so if we're ready, <laughs> indeed. Um, so we left off at uh, Herman, uh, uh, Hermano, Garcia, yeah, the Garcia. Fist, the first one, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Herminio, well, I, I'm just so happy that I was able to find his real first name, which is Sandalio. <laughs> they don't even call the guy by his name, but no, anyway, <laughs> getting back to it. So the next claimed assassin is military figure, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Cannon. Dick Russell states while he was undertaking a book, Richard Case Nagel would tell him, quote, Cannon was part of the CIA unit that reported to Willoughby, and he indicated that Cannon was directly involved in the assassination of JFK. Hmm. Beyond some largely unproven claims the podcast offers, nothing regarding canon or what precisely would make him a viable assassin. So since the podcast series has again failed to provide us with background, I decided to find out information and more about this figure offered. Hmm. Joseph Jack Young Cannon was born in mid-1914, and his mother's German origin allowed him to learn her native language. This detail proved of later use during his World War II enlistment with the United States military. According to one source, he, quote, served in Borneo and Manila during World War II as an explosives expert and became one of the first Americans to enter Tokyo after the war arriving in September 1945 as a member of the 411th Counterintelligence Corps, CIC. Mm-hmm. Cannon is credited with using explosives to, quote, open the safe at the German embassy, where he discovered documents that showed the notorious Sorga spy ring was still in operation. Richard Sorga was a member of the press who had also been creating Soviet spy rings for gathering intelligence prior to 1925 in multiple nations. Sorga was using a ring of agents in post-war Japan as well until he was apprehended by the Japanese and executed amidst 1941. But elements of his operation survived until their discovery by Cannon years later. When he presented the documents to his superiors in G2, he was given command of his own agents to seek out further enemies in Japan. Quote, originally known as Z-Unit, it was created in 1946 along with other groups by G2 Intelligence Wing of the General Headquarters under Major General Charles A. Willoughby. Z-Unit was formed to combat the progress of communist forces abroad and the increased demonstration of, quote, leftist groups within Japan. Lieutenant Colonel Jack Cannon used Army Intelligence's Z-Unit headquartered in Tokyo to conduct intelligence operations with Japan, North Korea, and Soviet areas. According to the CIA, this group became known as the, quote, Cannon Agency. And one media source notes, the Cannon Agency was a black operation group that dates back to the early days of the occupation of Japan by U.S. military forces. Mm -hmm. Cannon recruited more than two dozen agents that he would train to undertake, quote, secret operations against the Soviet Union and communist sympathizers in Japan. Let me pause for one second. This is interesting. I don't understand (laughs) – I, I, you know, there's more to go and I'll finish it quickly, but there, there's so much, like even about Garcia as well, there was so much interesting background that might have actually given some weight to some of the things they said, but they never bothered. Well, look. They it, just threw these names out and those are the guys. Right. Those, that's our best educated guess. And they're doing it in approximately half hour chunks, except for the bonus episodes and the introduction. Uh, you know, cause I looked over, I, I skimmed yeah. and I couldn't sit through this podcast. I, I gotta tell you, even though it's a, an average of a half hour each episode, I couldn't sit through it because <laughs> it was such a mess. And it hurt, but it made me want to find out more about the people they claimed so that I could disprove it. Right, but they even had these 10 and 15 minute bonuses, and I'm like, ah, oh, it yeah. just, it was so much. And, and I'm yeah, like. Yeah, no, but they had good material. They didn't, I mean, if they just would have a little bit of work. Anyway. A so, little bit of work. Like, all they would have had to do is had Soledad O'Brien or somebody sit there and yeah. go ahead, different voice, even if Reiner didn't want to read it, right? Yeah. Have somebody do a read of. And for background information, and a completely different voice drops in, you know, sort of like a documentary film where you have different voices come on and it shifts around. And I think but I think they were also concerned about losing people's interest here with the way they designed this, because I think it's anywhere from 25 to 38 minutes is the average. Yeah, they were shorting for the short attention span. They were not trying to cater to people wanting to deep dive. Right. So 
but anyway, uh, go go ahead. Okay. That's why I think the backgrounds were not included. But you're right. I, Just a little. I mean, yeah. even a little, because you're I'm, what I'm about to go into is like Bond villainesque. Yeah, Cannon's I mean, interesting. I mean, he, he didn't do it probably. Right, <laughs> probably yeah. nothing to do with it whatsoever, based on what they've claimed. Yeah. But he's an interesting figure right. and an interesting character they should explore. Right now, Joe, don't you think that even when you're bringing up somebody that you, you're you're not about to add into the legitimate plot? It is of interest to say, let's tell you who the hell this guy is. I mean, don't you think that would have been a great way to go about it and give some of these, you know, more, I don't know, expansive and informative details? What do you think, Joe? Of, of course I do. And uh, Jack Cannon is a very interesting figure. He apparently was involved in Cuban uh, activities uh, back until 1961 mm -hmm. based on a document that Rob found but and apparently had some connection to Santiago's uh, disappearance in 1964 or capture that's right. a better word and uh, they covered that on their last quick hits but it Yes, you, you have to provide context. You have to provide some sources uh, to be taken seriously. But that wasn't the goal. The goal was to sell it, just like the other one. Ex <laughs> just exactly. Like the other podcast you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah. To tell, tell the good story. And, and, and that, that was the goal. And. Yeah. That's what they did. And just note to the listener, I have uncredited voice reads that, that people have asked me to do for some of these other podcasts. I, I'm not going to say which ones or anything, but you can find it out there where I've turned around and I've read somebody's background bio, dropped it in for somebody else on other podcasts. Okay. So I'm, I know it's possible and it doesn't make your time run too bad if you give me a minute or two to do what Carmine's doing right here. Filling yeah, in just the background. It's uh, I'm yeah, we we just consolidate, you know, the most important points and Right. Four or five interesting points of this is why this guy could be an operator of some type, whether you believe him to be or not. Well yeah. and what's ironic is is that as I'll finish this off, you'll see that Cannon actually would have been a much better mastermind type <laughs> than he would have ever been an assassin. I don't think he did either. I don't think he was connected whatsoever. Right. But I think that a figure like him, kind of like when I talk about uh, um, John Henry Hill, the one that I traced 15 minutes away from Dealey Plaza just before, in a figure like that in the mold of what we're looking for. So anyway. You're, um, talking, you're talking about the guy who was pissed at Kennedy and, and then turned around and bought a gun that day? That guy? Yep, and then yeah. walked down the streets of Dallas. <laughs> this is a <laughs> guy a with a gun in his hands on the streets of Dallas moments before – yeah, finished Kennedy's, lunch with his wife yeah. 20 minutes before the assassination and then was – no one knew where he went after lunch. Yeah, should have been a person of interest who just poof, goes away on a hunting trip. Uh, yeah. Well, he was a millionaire. <laughs> that too. But anyway, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. That helps. So uh, the group's headquarters in Japan was called the Hongo House, a large estate with a reported 17,000-acre premises. That was comprised of multiple buildings that included a mansion, a, quote, 44-room Japanese-style house and billiard house. Cannon was a noted firearms aficionado, uh, uh, according to one former agent, and could recite the specifications of many firearms, quote, decorated the immense estate's gardens with empty cans, bottles, and even light bulbs. He would conduct daily target practice, quote, often firing from his desk with the gold-plated pistol he always carried. He spent most of his time undertaking intelligence operations, repeated combat with local gangs, and developing his pistol expertise. While certainly this colorful personality often practiced with a pistol, none of the information regards rifle expertise or constant practice with larger weapons. But it, like I said, it's, it's almost a Bond-esque villain. <laughs> mm -hmm. That he's got a gold-plated gun he always carries around. And he's always shooting things from his desk in a mansion. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Okay, so the Cannon Group carried arms, made arrests, and carried out interrogations. They also reportedly conducted kidnappings, used torture, and operated safe houses that spanned across Japan. Among Cannon's successes was the infiltration of the, quote, newly established government of the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, in North Korea amid 1948. 
Using criminal informants, Cannon would learn that North Korea was, quote, manufacturing heroin to flood the Tokyo-Yokohama area with it. Canon agency interpreter Victor Matsui noted the goal of the DPRK was to sell the drugs in Japan and provide those resources to Japan's Communist Party. A more insidious connected goal of this effort by North Korea was to, quote, turn as many American soldiers into possible heroin addicts as possible and to render them useless for the upcoming battle they expected in the future. Clashes between communist aligned nations and the United States. Mm-hmm. Attempting to neutralize this effort, Cannon would direct his agents to impersonate a Yakuza Japanese criminal gang and deal with the North Koreans to capture as much of the heroin sent for distribution as possible. While this did temporarily negate the attempts of the DPRK, eventually the ruse was detected and with no large growth in American military drug users emerged. This prompted the North Koreans to make contacts with genuine Yakuza gangs inside Japan and set up a network for distributing their illicit products. And the Cannon Agency reacted by violent attacks on such groups aiding the North Koreans. During one gunfight with Yakuza gangs, Cannon himself was injured after being shot in the leg. Hmm. The Cannon Agency would quickly be shut down by the authority of the Central Intelligence Agency, who assumed operational control of their projects in the 50s. Cannon, during 1952, was transferred by request to Fort Hood, and following his later retirement would eventually invent new types of firearms ammunition. While attempting to perfect the Glazer safety slug and building a gun in his McLean, Texas home, Cannon would accidentally discharge two rounds into his chest and died from the wounds. Mm. <laughs> Regarding, I'm sorry, you didn't say? Well, yeah, I just, you know, I'm thinking to myself, this, this is very interesting detail, a whole lot of stuff that we missed. And uh, th- there's the end of his life. I think we can move on to the next guy. And yep. get into, you know, kind of kind of tie a bow on this because we're about two and a half hours in. It's a little longer than the other ones. And I think we, we, to be continued, obviously. Um, but I, I don't want to, you know, go way too far. Oh, yeah, no, we can talk more on the other stuff. But I'm, I'm yeah. be able to knock out these right now, these because these, when you'll see. So uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so regarding the canon allegation, I would note the other lack of credibility of Nigel's statements based upon past claims and no offered evidence. Mm -hmm. Further, since he had no access to CIA files, groups of personnel in the years before the assassination, Nigel could not have any knowledge of a special compartmentalized group operating in that period with Cannon. I additionally would mention that Cannon appeared years prior in an interview with Russell uh, conducted with Gerald Hemming, another questionable source of JFK information, Mm -hmm. in which Hemming claims that Cannon is a mafia-related figure. Well, certainly in Japan, Cannon and his agents during the 40s and early 50s would impersonate news criminal sources. There's no proven relationship between him and the U.S. Mafia. The supposed idea appears to be that a man nearly 50 years old with an old leg injury, no proven practice, a demonstrable motive, or being present is one of the assassins. Similar to the Garcia claim, this has no proof but relies upon endorsements of men found to have been wrong repeatedly. The third assassin named was Jean Sautre. He is a quite infamous terrorist that attempted to engage with U.S. officials to seek the overthrow of France's government under Charles de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. After being rebuffed by American leaders, he would later claim that he was in Dallas and was, quote, expelled from the U.S. at Fort Worth or Dallas 48 hours after the assassination. Yet the basis of this story is merely Sautra himself, and it rests upon the belief of French officials but has no evidence to support it. If one trusts Sautra's word – What is one to think when he subsequently claimed to the press later that he possessed no connection to the assassination? Additionally, a noted Sautra associate, Lawrence Alderson, would claim the French criminal was involved with the JFK assassination, but this was after he told the FBI earlier that, to his knowledge, Sautra was not in the United States during that period. (laughs) These purported ideas rely upon the shifting words of a man that no evidence proves is present in the U.S. on the day of the assassination. Motivations for his tale could have related to seeking to project greater power to those who spurned him or authority for himself in the OAS. But in the end, the French connection, when compared to several documents, is quite deceptive. Mm. Finally, Charles Nicoletti. He was a notorious Chicago hitman and enforcer for mob boss Sam Giancana. And this series is just one of many over the years attempting to place him in Dealey Plaza. When I was inspecting the claims of mythmaker James Files in a past article, I came across quite useful information regarding Nicoletti. FBI documents from the period before and following the assassination of President Kennedy would challenge suppositions of his guilt in this matter. Similar to Johnny Roselli and other high-ranking mafia figures, Nicoletti was under Federal Bureau of Investigation surveillance due to his association to Sam DiStefano. A week before JFK died, Nicoletti and his associate were under investigation for the murder of Leo Foreman, a suspected FBI informant. 
Foreman's body was discovered less than a week before the assassination, and Nicoletti is last observed in Chicago by official informants. Nicoletti is obviously busy with his criminal enterprises within Chicago and under official surveillance during portions of this period. It's highly improbable he could have somehow contrived a role in the assassination, then rushed to Dallas unseen by anyone days prior, as some might claim. Once again, we are faced with an infamous person that has been attributed a role in these events, but these allegations lack any evidence or basic proof that he was even in the state of Texas that day. Ultimately, if we count all the people named in the podcast that supposedly had a foreknowledge of the plot, we have Charles Willoughby, William E. Harvey, E. Howard Hunt, Robert Plumley, Johnny Roselli, Jack Cannon, Charles Nicoletti, Jean Sautra, Richard Degel, Hermenio Garcia, Maurice Bishop, at least 11 people. One would assume that Nicoletti and Roselli were needed in order from, would have needed an order from a higher ranking mafioso, or would have been used by a handler, and that would add to the growing list of supposed conspirators, agents, and assassins. Remember, those are just the people they said were on the ground. That's not the conspirators. That's not handlers. So just add to that total. But there's no need to add to the list because I would contend it already contains unnecessary people such as Nigel, Plumley, Hunt, Nicoletti, Roselli, and Sautra, who we know are elsewhere or have proven to be inconsistent. Garcia, Bishop, and Cannon rest upon Nigel and Escalante, which both have believed in false leads, created false stories, and provide no evidence to support their ideas. William Harvey and General Willoughby have been the source of conspiracy ideas by multiple offers, but again, we venture into recycled speculations without evidence. Harvey, at least, is certainly a figure in the mold of someone that could be involved, but anyone could be involved. In mm-hmm. the end, the answer Reiner provides us as to who killed JFK is his best guess. But there's no f- foundation of demonstrable facts. Mm-hmm. And you've just been Reiner! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that was the moment. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, it is it is what it is. And uh, again, when you just sit back for a second and try to place Nicoletti together <laughs> with, you know, the, the, the French guy alongside of the Cuban guy alongside. How in the hell do you even pull this composite together? You know, it's it's much like the weirdness yeah. of people that, that, that seem to think that they have this definite idea about, you know, uh, well, Sam Giancana, you know, uh, Sal Giancana took, uh, you know, Salvatore was his real first name. But the point is, they they uh, they they say he took over the mafia th- during this particular year in Chicago and therefore blah, 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 blah. And this links to Nicoletti and this links to guess what? James Miles. Uh, you know, so on and so forth. Look, if you eliminate even the bad pieces of evidence, you have giant holes here where it's almost impossible to tie people together. It's like assuming, and it, it, it's just, I've seen this before with, you know, with the LBJ idea, right? It's like, well, he was corrupt. Yes, indeed. Corruption is also yeah. not a murderer, first of all. But let's just say he was a murderer. Precisely. And, let, and that's what I think people don't understand is that. He was a criminal. He might have even been likely responsible for murders, just not the murder we're interested in. <laughs> There's the problem. It's not about, you know, was he a bad guy? It's not about yeah. is, you know, Nicoletti capable of killing people? Sure he is. Oh, yeah. They're all villains. and uh, Yeah. The men we talked about earlier are all villains and murderers. But that doesn't mean they killed JFK, especially when most of them are on the other side, other continents sometimes. <laughs> so there you go. So you got you to use some logic. You got to put people, you know, at least not somewhere else at the time. <laughs> OK, if you can d- definitively place them elsewhere, then they can't physically be there as shooters. And this is the trouble over and over again. If you don't dig into this and actually do the research and track these things down and it's not easy. But if you don't, you're going to end up with the mythology. You're going to end up with, well, maybe the Zapruder film was faked and therefore the limo driver shot him. And if the limo driver didn't shot him, maybe the guy behind him with the AR-15 shot him in the head accidentally. If, (laughs) you know, you you end up with those things seeming plausible because why? You don't know the actual evidence. If you did, you'd know that these things are disqualified on the face of the claim to begin with. So anyway, with that, I appreciate you guys taking the time. Joe, I want to get your overall impressions of this uh, for a minute. 
before we close out and let everybody know where they can uh, find the lone gunman. Uh, I'm going to give links, any links you give, send me afterwards, I'll add to the show notes and all that, but any links you want to give me, I'll, I'll definitely distribute them to the audience as well. But Joe, your final thoughts on this uh, JFK Mits episode. Well, I thought it was great and I am uh, very happy to be a part of it. And to join you guys, we could be, we can be found at the Lone Gunman podcast on almost every podcast platform. We do live shows every week now. We have taken our show live. We've been interacting with a lot of the listeners and um, we're very excited. We have some fun plans and fun research uh, plan for 2024. I am talking, I won't give it away, with the namesake of a very important person uh, related to Marina, uh, her lawyer's son, and that kind of ties back to the whole Martin thing, but we have a lot of interesting things we're looking to do. We're trying to move things forward. We're not tied to any theory. We are open-minded. We are open to new facts. And in the end, we are researchers and not storytellers. We may not be perfect. God knows I'm not. But uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, Carmine, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I have a lot more myths to debunk for future episodes. Well, definitely can't wait to hear those. And also a quick shout out to Rob Clark and Doug Campbell. Uh, quick hits also is a podcast. I think it's available on the same stream that, uh, same streams out there that the lone gunman is. And you guys also have a YouTube channel. You do, I think live YouTubes, uh, every so often, yep. but there'll be links to all that in the show description. Carmine, outside of uh, your books and, of course, tpaak.com, uh, what are your final thoughts for tonight? I know we didn't get to everything, but I think we did a pretty good job demolishing at least one subset of myths uh, that has been recently introduced into the stream, so to speak, um, and uh, a lot more work to do. We're going to have to do many more of these episodes, uh, my friend. I hope so. And, yeah, no, I uh, appreciate uh, everything that uh, Joe said and introduced us to, and I'm looking forward to to future episodes. And of course, Mike. And uh, if people want to check me out, Chuck has said it before, but it's tpaak.com, t-p-a-a-k.com, and I've finally added a donate button after 20 people told me over 10 years. <laughs> right. So if you'd like to, feel free. I'm not going to promote that too much. I mean, I. Uh, I am not one of the uh, the aforementioned uh, two members of that uh, overly promoting show. <laughs> no, but look, fair enough. Th that you referred to. But every once in a while, you know, I might say something. But it, it does help. There are costs that I'm sure Joe and Chuck both know that are associated with running everything. So every every donation helps, whether it's big or small, and even if people just want to listen. I've, you know, received a lot of support over the years and – I appreciate people coming out and sending messages, you know, and, you know, I know Chuck does too. And so does Joe and Rob, but, um, yeah, I, th I hope we did a, we did a good service to the people tonight. I hope the audience enjoyed it. And I think we knocked it down rather effectively. <laughs> no, <absolutely. laughs> this, this set anyway. <laughs> This subset of myths, yeah. so to speak. But, I mean, there, there's a lot more work to do, like I said. And, yeah, absolutely. Look, you can support the Lone Gunman, tpoc.com, uh, the Ocelli Effect. We we have – some of us have donate buttons. Some of us have other ways. But you know what? Even if you just share the information, you put it out on social media, you tell yep. friends, uh, all of these things are important. And it expands our efforts to continue to explore not only this topic, but, you know, there's been a lot of focus on it, and I've, I've recently refocused on the JFK assassination. Some people might not be pleased with that, but this is the way I'm going. Uh, I'm really sick and tired of the general American politics, and I'm still going to cover it, but not as much, because I'd rather get at something that, even though it's messy and contentious, um, you know, seems, I don't know, 
it just seems like this is where I need to be focusing at the moment. So that's what I'm doing. That's what Carmine does. That's what Joe and Rob do. And, of course, again, shout out to Doug, uh, Doug Campbell, uh, the Dallas Action, the Quick Hits, and uh, the Lone Gunman. Those are podcasts I would say you go look at, Lone Gunman, Lone Gunman. Uh, yeah, podcast, go ahead and check that out. I, I have to have fun with this, guys. I really do. Yes. But uh, I appreciate all you guys the for top, tuning in. The yes. top lone nutter podcasts out there. Sure, why not? Why not? You've just been reined. You know, and uh, we we continue to shout out to those that need to be shouted out to, <laughs> and appreciate your support. Uh, absolutely. Just been reined. And that too. So uh, for Mike Swanson, who was with us only in the first hour tonight, Carmine Savastano and Joe Borelli, Joe Scooter Borelli, which I won't tell you why we're calling him Scooter, but uh, there's a good reason for it. Anyway. Yeah. No matter who you are.